Welcome, Pokemon trainers! We are going to jump straight into the All Peace and MSS round one, Tarim Birdie vs. Alex Butters. And here we are, the leads of Tornadus and Landorus against Tarim's up, uh, up to oh, <laughs> Landorus and off. Tornadus. <laughs> Oh, it's, it's a perfect mirror, which is uh, always good to see in VGs. It reminds me back in the days in 2015, <laughs> 2016, anytime these two are in a format together. And uh, luckily, people don't run Defiant on their Tornadus, because that would have been a bit of an awkward situation. But, you know, this is going to be the same old age old tale of someone clicks Tailwind, someone can maybe click a Rock Slide, try and get a flinch, because Landorus is really stuck into doing that. Maybe you turning out, change things. But it's that Tailwind to Taran, just playing it safe. Go for that hyper offense he's really known for. Yes, and exactly. And the U turn coming out straight away from Taran's Landorus. So, indicating that Alex is not going for. Oh, wait, is that Alex? Are we looking at Alex? Oh, we are on Alex. Yes, yeah, so, <laughs> so Taran did not go for a Tailwind this turn. So, Landorus is probably going to use some sort of non priority move, like bleak wind storm and you're kind of indicating that maybe Tyron wants to save that tailwind for a following turn that is always a really good thing to go for because if you save it for that other turn you get that you know that extra turn of tailwind with bleak wind storm having that chance to get the speed drop it doesn't quite get it there which is a bit unfortunate but still does big damage and now he can preserve tailwind it's only that one turn extra but that is still something that can be massive going forwards into the rest of the matches and even if you just keep steamrolling those bleak wind storms until tailwind runs out yes it gives them the advantage to have that tailwind the extra turn but it doesn't really matter anything landris does switch out preserving that intimidate so i have to see what tarant goes for here maybe it could be tailwind to save something but it's iron hands <laughs> so the mirror continues <laughs> even further yes both players kind of realizing that you know the pokemon that they pick for this match is just the best against each other's teams and you know looking at their team sheets it is there, there are a lot of similarities there's the iron hands tornadoes Fluttermain and Landorus that's shared across both teams. The difference is the Ogre Pond forms. Taron is running a Wellspring Ogre Pond, whereas Alex is running the Fire one. And the Amoongus on Taron's team, not something that's quite uh, common, as or well, it's dropped a little bit in usage for regulation. He's you know, still a very, very strong Pokemon. And I think Alex is running Urshifu, Dark, so a lot of offensive output from there. A lot of offensive output, like you know, the, the Ogre Pond Fire. You know, I, I've snuck on a bit more because it's got the more breakability plus gets the attack boost when it does terrestrialize, which is very, very good, especially when you see things like Heat Drown now forced to run something like Ability Shield to stop it, and that also means to not run a kind of Salt Vest so it and takes special hits as well. We do see Taran has that, that less orthodox Wellspring form. It's not the most unused one, I said the Rock one's the most unused one, but it's still nice to come see that as it does play a more supportive role. Talking about support though, Lander is coming in and getting some Intimidates down. It is the up dog, but it is doing the down dog on the Intimidate. <laughs> and we do see a fake out coming out here. So it is just going to stop that. The Alex's Iron Hands doing anything. Bleak Windstorm does come out from Taran, misses as it always does. <gasps> and double miss as well, something you hate to see. And it's just going to put Taran in that state where he's not relying on this damage as much. He's going to have to rely on that speed he can get from Tailwind. There's no drops that happened as well, so it's really, really unlucky for Taran so far. Yeah, not the best turn for Taran, but at the same time, you know, the Tornadus is still at full health right now, so it's still very much free to go for another Tailwind later on in this game. You know, Tornadus is not, not the bulkiest of Pokemon, but with proper training, it can withstand quite a lot of hits. And, you know, this Iron Hands on both... Are they both at minus one? I can't actually... Quite, I don't know. No, Taran's Iron Hands is at minus one from the land was switching, but I think Alex's Iron Hands is at oh is not has not had the intimidate drop but it looks like Landorus is going to come in and he's going to drop that uh, Iron Hands down to minus one it is going to do exactly that and that is something you need to do on, on these Iron Hands like it's one of those Pokemon that is slowly start becoming more offensive like when we first saw it it was just it was just a wall it would take hits and then do damage over time players now in the format arena making it more and more offensive relying on so i've seen some boost range ones of course taran's isn't that boost range nor is alex's so it's going to be nice to know what goes forward from that we do see double that's drain punch getting a bit of health back and that's that's good as well because like you're not doing much damage with your drain punches because he's intimidates so but you're still getting your health back and you can still force situations where you have the most hp and that's what iron hands has been doing recently as well is sitting there until the end game and being that reliant piece in like okay i could just sit here with my hp and stall out but it's unseen what the play is because both these players are playing very very offensive teams from the looks of it yeah quite a good defensive turn from Taran that last turn now that Tailwind has been stored out so you know all Pokemon will have the kind of their natural speed which means that looking at the team looks like Taran's oh actually no Alex's Landorus is going to be Choice Scarf so unless the Tornadus 
goes for a tailwind, which it looks like actually both Landorus are holding a choice scarf and uh, Taran's one going before Alex's. Either it's a speed tie or one's just faster than the other, but a bleak wind storm finally hitting and knocking out that pesky, um, uh, not Among Us, <laughs> <laughs> Iron Hands from Alex's side. Yeah, getting rid of Iron Hands is really, really good. It's something that, you know, as I've said before, it used to be that wall poke on these like maximum special defense, and they're starting to draw back a bit now, being more of an offensive presence. Ogrebon coming in, which is going to be something that everyone loves to see because it's going to be you know putting out its fullest rage. If that thing terrestrializes, it loses its grass type, which is good in front of that Tornadus, but it does gain that pure that pure fire type, which is bad for this Landorus. So it's you got to flip the coin here if you're Alex. You think, do I let Landorus do more damage to me, or do I let the Tornadus do more damage to me? Landorus can be controlled at least with their own Landorus, which has to switch out this turn to get that drop down but also you have spiky shield which you know can really put a bit of pressure down but Taran pro revealing that scarf and showing how 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 much you can go for these attacks that don't make contact it should be fine it's usually another switch here getting up to another same which covers you know if a ground type move goes there spiky shield as well stops it from getting any damage it can deal damage if it goes into it and it also means landorus can now come back in quite safely in another turn drop an intimidate giving Obon that ability to go for that terrestrialization and be a little bit safer in the face of what is a super strong landorus yes and Terra's landorus is locked into that stomping tantrum so alex could just switch out his Ogopon into the landorus the next time but it looks like with the tornadoes taking the bleak wind storm and getting knocked out the Ogopon is stuck so even though Taran's Landorus is also stuck doing Stomping Tantrum, the, the Spiky Shield has been used up that last turn, so there's only a 30% chance of it succeeding this turn if Alex chooses to go for it. So, you know, this Ogopon's not really having the best of time, but of course Taran's Landorus is at minus one, so we'll see how it's trained and whether or not it can actually survive that Stomping Tantrum. You'd want to hope it can survive it because, you know, if you're facing something as common as Landorus, you're going to have to think, I want to have that Intimidate drop, I want to get it down. The other case is you can maybe rely on Landorus being faster than the Tornado, so it probably would have a Choice Scarf, get a Rock Slide Flinch or something like that, a big damage down to try and put that pressure on, not have Scrastalize. Landorus switching out, though, means that Intimidate can be recycled even further, which even with that attack boost, Ogopon is going to get once it Scrastalizes, it is going to be on that back foot over and over again. And that Protect there as well just slows down any play of, of Alex trying to get some Rock Slide Flinches to, to slow, change the side of the game. And that's where it is. It does go into that protect. It's going to do very little to this Iron Hands because it is just so beefy and with resistances. And Ivy Surgeon will come on out and go into that protect as well. So no real damage going through. And that Intimidate is now free for Taran to bring back in. And there's, now it's just a constant loop where you can nerf one of these super strong Pokemon just because of the fact that there's that preservation and Iron Hands being so thick can fake out as well. And just you can just loop Landorus Intimidate, come back in, fake out, and just rinse and repeat that. And I think Taran can just control the game from here and just use the stronger Pokemon you know, to get through that those weaker defenses whilst also chipping away at those attack stats. Yeah, Taran's in a really, really strong position here. And it's also really interesting that the Tornadus has been on the field since turn one and has not taken a single bit of damage. So, you know, Taran's playing very defensively with the Tornadus, you know, protecting every now and then. That, that protect last turn was really well done, just, you know, with the double up but now this ogre pond is a terrifier so it is going to get uh oh it does it get the attack i've forgotten i it think does, it's it, the, attack yeah, the attack boost so it's nullifying the the landrus intimidate attack drop and we'll see how much the ivy cudgel is going to do onto this ogre pond oh the ogre pond it, it took a lot of damage in that drain punch though which is a shows how fragile Ogopon is becoming and most people are just running like pure offense on, on the fire one because it, it just does that job. I would schedule even at neg one with the terrestrialization boost with the boost to its Ooh. stat does get through it. So actually I guess it'll be a, a neutral now because the neg one was then nullified by the attack boost. So with Tornado's finally being gone after sitting around on this funny little cloud for the entire game here, it is going to put that pressure on because now you can't rely on tailwinds and bleak wind storms to get that speed advantage. Landorus again can kind of pseudo give that advantage because you're, you're dropping the stats so you can take more hits than they can dish out so i have to see if that is enough to control the field here or will it just be a case of you know rinse and repeat switching for both players to try and use intimidate to knock things down or does it get that outright knockout where it is needed you know crits can always happen flinch can always happen but that will always be a benefit to other players you see terrestrialization i believe that is a terror that's terror flying coming out so it's gonna be even weaker so those rock slides, which can be a bit dangerous, even with that neg one attack. 
Yeah, so the Landris is on her, uh, Alex's side, stuck doing the rock side, of course. It's gonna have to take that Terror Blast first, and it's just enough to knock it out. You know, Landris, one of the best Pokemon in this regulation E format, being able to check just so many common Pokemon and having such a great ability, and Drain Punch just knocking out the Okapon. So, Okapon, you know, putting in some work, knocking out the Tornadoes, but in the end, without the speed advantage, it just wasn't able to take a, like, advantage of the fact that it has really good attack. It has yeah, it has that really good attack and like I said, Landorus is just one of those behemoths that is just gonna sit there all throughout the tournament and a match. To, it, it'll just do its thing. It, if it's a choice band variant, it's gonna be super strong. If it's an assault vest or a scarf variant, it can use its speed or its bulk to have that pressure, like you turning to get a switch to get intimidate. You can rock side to get those flinches, and that is just something that Landorus does in and out. And where we've got such a physically offensive format, it. Isn't it? Isn't really you know going to be in, out of its out of its zone trying to sort things out? And you have to see if Taran. Well, both players probably just bring it again. Taran can maybe take that same advantage of keeping it safe to that end game, waiting for the the two versus four or two versus three, and then loop it as much as possible to nullify what is in front of them. Yes, that Landris intimidates cycling coming in and out was doing a really good job of just you know controlling the the damage output on both sides of the team. And I'm wondering if because that you know a play that maybe Alex is thinking about, and we do see that on the screen, uh, bringing that Urshifu because of course Urshifu's signature move, this dark one. Which with a uh, wicked blow is always a guaranteed a critical hit, which means that it's not going to care about getting any sort of intimidate drops. Of course, it does mean that the Urshifu, the the, the dark, the single strike one, has a bit more weaknesses. So that is something that Alex has to be a bit careful of adjusting into this second game. They are going to be very very careful with that adjustment and we'll see if that is implemented we do see Landorus plus Tornadus and a change up here from Alex with the Flutter main so we could see a Tailwind plus just big damage we could see Sunny Day plus big damage this could maybe incentivize Taran to go for that Tailwind to try and outspeed the the possibility of Sunny Day plus big damage but then we have to think you know, will Alex think that same thing will Alex think okay I'll go for the Tailwind so I can then switch into something or you know it, it's a mind game whenever you see things like Flutter Pain because it's so strong with and more about the Protosynthesis boost that you can just you just have to think what it's going to do it is going to switch out though which means that Alex is going to be preserving it for later and I do believe it was the Urshifu coming in which is going to be okay because it hasn't been intimidated yet but if we see a Bleak Wind Storm it's not going to be very happy with that and that Traskalization straight away meaning Ooh. that I believe that is that's the Landorus, so that's going to be Terra Fly, so if you see a Terra Blast into <laughs> that slot, that is a double bad situation. It is a very bad news bears for this bear right now. And then, you know, it, it could be an amazing call. There's that Tailwind, which covers every box possible, and see if, if Alex tries to match that, goes to that sunny day. It'll, no, it oh, no. Oh, and here we go. Terra Blast from Taran's side, coming straight into the Urshifu, just the one hit knockout. That Urshifu, of course, at, oh, wait, I didn't notice it was holding into his focus sash. So it is going to survive, but you know, a sliver of health, it's very, very weak, and, and no Tailwind coming off of, I think. Taran's Urshifu, also not Urshifu, um, Tornadus also oh, does not carry Taunt, so it is not able to stop um, Alex from going for a follow up Tailwind. So, you know, Alex not really in the worst of positions because he can still go for a Tailwind, and if he manages to stall out Taran's Tailwind, he He's got that one turn of speed range. But Iron Hands is going to come in, and you know, Landorus has done its job n knocking down that Urshifu to his focus action. Urshifu is just gonna protect or detect this turn to make sure it survives. Yeah, detecting it just keeps it as safe as possible. Also, in the back of my mind, you know, you can maybe go for a sucker punch to try and call something, but with a prankster Pokemon right in front of you, know, Pokemon that love to be switching about, it's really, really never safe to go for that sucker punch unless you're super sure of it. And now we have the state where Iron Hand is on, and we could see a fake out into one of these Pokemon. Maybe a fake out into the Urshifu to make sure it, gets, it goes down, it cannot protect this turn. Or you fake out the the tornadoes and make sure that it can't get any damage any damage or any status done for itself and that means that you can then bring landris in drop an intimidate not that it's really useful at the state we're in you know, one hp on your urshifu and then a special attacker yes it's nice to have it back when it's needed but at least you know it's safe in the back there already and alex you know has the ability to try and change the flow of the game but it's just in a position where you know it's gonna be very hard flutter main comes on in it's not gonna like a sucker punch or wicked blow too much if it takes it but you know it, there is a switch out which means that it's gonna be taking either of those so now it's gonna be down to tornadoes to try and put some damage down and with fake out on the horizon it is very very hard to do that mob activates there on ogre pond but not gonna be very very useful in this state is it is that tailwind 
which is kind of an advantage, but with Landorus waiting to come into the field here, it is going to be super, super scary. A very good switch in from Alex here, you know, switching that Okapon, resisting that heavy slammer from the Iron Hands, and Okapon is in quite a good position to be start dealing out really heavy damage, and of course Tornadoes does have Sunny Day, so it could potentially go for that to try to mitigate any sort of intimidate attack drops from maybe an incoming Landorus from Terran side. Of course, one thing Alex does need to remember is that the Flutter main from on Taran's side is going to benefit from Sunny Day if Alex does choose to go for it. And it looks like Alex is, you know, hovering over the moves, kind of also probably taking into account the fact that maybe maybe he does not want to give that Flutter main a boost. And you know Flutter main is not very bulky on the physical side, so it's quite likely that oh actually you know there's no land for switch in this turn. The Shadow Ball's gonna come and immediately knock it out. So that poor Ogre Pond has not had a single chance to get an attack off. Ogapon didn't get attacked this game, and that is just a the complete contrast to that first one. Ogapon was trying its best to do everything. A wild charge coming out there gets the knockout onto Tornadus. So now we have that position that Taran was in earlier, where he has now more Pokemon that can just do that constant loop of bringing in, bring in the Tornado, the Landorus, bringing in something else. With Fluttermane and, and Arshifu being the options, you know, Arshifu on one HP, something can just look at it and it is going to fall over, especially when you've got that four times effective move right in front of it. Not that it really matters in the game state right now. And with Fluttermane here, you know, you can just Shadow Ball into that and you can Terrestrialize to try and take a few more turns and dish a bit of damage out on the return, but that is really all we can see Alex doing right now to try and have an essence of what can be damaged going forward. But of course, you know, it then comes down to what Taran does. Taran can maybe read the room a bit well and just get that Landorus in to drop an Intimidate because that means that a Sucker Punch have a bit of a better role going on to the Fluttermane as well. But you know, we don't know what sort of defensive investment this Fluttermane has because some have started going a lot more like HP and physical defense rather than speed special attack just to make sure it takes those hits from some of the more common Pokemon. And I think there are some counts where Chen Pao even fails to knock you out unless it's very, very extreme circumstances. Yeah, so Alex, you know, even though he's down to his last two Pokemon, these are very strong options for his last two Pokemon, and he does have that one last turn of Tailwind advantage. Then we see that Fluttermane going for the Terra Fairy, you know, locking in. Is that a choice specs Fluttermane? Yes, it, it is. is. So, you know, locking into that Dowsing Gleam is going to be dealing a lot of damage, and it looks like, you know, uh, Taran just choosing not to swap out his Pokemon, maybe choosing to preserve his Pokemon so that once the Tornadus and the Landris come on in, he can just go for the Tailwind and just start you know, taking a lot of hits. And Oshifu oh, going for the Wicker Blow, so double knockout, the critical here, really not mattering there. But now both players are down to their final two Pokemon. They're down to these final two, and you, know, you couldn't really pick a better two to have on this field right now. Like, Yes, Landorus is going to go and get that Intimidate down, but Fluttermane doesn't really care what that is. You can maybe see, I can't remember if Tailwind turns did end, I did not quite catch it, but all you can maybe do is just go for a Tailwind with the Tornadus, and then Landorus is going to outspeed both these Pokemon. A Rock Slide to do the job, if not, you play it safe and you Stomping Tantrum, and you just play around things like Sucker Punches. With that Attack Drop, you know, you're, they're locked into that Wicked Blow to guarantee the most amount of damage as possible. But at that same time, if you can speed creep things, if you can out, you know, choice cast on Landra. So if you got that wicked blow, you can play it safe and go into that slot. Tailwind comes out. So this is basically just Taran's time just to sit comfortably and just use speed to her advantage. Terra Blast comes out, you know, guaranteeing you're hitting something for a very good amount of damage. Fluttermane is probably going to go down to that. It isn't the bulkiest Pokemon, especially when you see these choice specs variants. And now it's just going to be Urshifu versus the Wall, but both these Pokemon in front of it, they've both got Stab, super effective moves into it. It isn't going to have a fun time, even if this Wicker Blow does get a knockout. Yeah, and now here comes the mind games, because if the Tornadus goes for attack, it will faint to a uh, Sucker Punch, because Tornadus is in a real, is heavily, heavily chipped on Taran's side, so it is going to go down to a minus one, a Wicked Blow. So, you know, is, uh, is Alex going to predict some sort of maybe Protect, or some sort of Tailwind to end the combat? But it's like a punch coming off so Alex gets the call correctly against Taron and we are going to go into a game three we're going into the game three and yeah it's one of those games that turn around in the very last the very last second it was yeah it looked like it was Taron through and then it got to that very very last bit and it's like oh oh no Alex has got it no sucker punch came in clutch and I guess with tornadoes in the field Pokemon that normally over really carries one attacking move you can't bluff the whole am I going to go for an attack am I going to go for a status move for too many turns before the player realizes they're just spamming buttons to try and waste my TP and at that point you know you just wait for tailwind to end and then just wicked blow and hope there's a, there's a good speed interaction or hope that the bleak windstorm misses there's so many things that happen in that yeah. scenario that 
I think Alex just threw caution into the wind and just hoped, you know, won those buttons to press. And I think Taran kind of realized as well that you have to, you know, he had to throw caution in the wind and think he could predict maybe a status move not going to suck a punch, but both players had to play a mind game there and it seemed that Alex did take the winning one. Yeah, it was really, really exciting to see Alex, you know, winning that mind game in the end. And I think, was that, because I was actually not too sure, is that the game three or That was, we're going to game three. Oh, okay, we're going to game three. <laughs> Because I wasn't sure if they had finished off because we jumped into the middle, but yeah. So basically, kind of, you know, Alex making the correct adjustments, bringing that Urchin, bringing that Flutter May, keeping those two Pokemon in the back for that late game sweep, even though, you know, at one stage, it looked pretty scary for Alex, you know, having two Pokemon against all four of Taran's team. Of course, his earlier Pokemon had chipped all of Taran's Pokemon enough to the point where, you know, the Urshifu with the Focus Dash coming in so clutch was able to pull out the game. And, you know, Pokemon didn't really do much both games. So I wonder if Alex will bring it into this game three. It, it's one of those Pokemon that you both want and don't want. Like, in the state, it's been doing well where it's just been getting knocked out really quickly or doing minimal damage to the victim. And they, you're not really happy with what it's doing. But it also feels that for some of these Pokemon that you're seeing, you have to really rely on that damage. To see what is the option for this game three as our players have locked in their teams are going to be raring to go. You know, taking Tara into a game three is a thing that not many people get to do, obviously. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, he is our current incumbent multiple time champion here at Orpington PCs and MSSs. So it's going to be nice to say if you get that work, that round one win, you can hold that crown of I basically won an Orpington <laughs> PC. But uh, that, of course, is only a bit of a serotonin boost as we do see that it is our same old lead from game one. So players may be thinking, if it isn't broken, don't fix it. Just bring bread and butter, go for it. And now we have that mind game again of who goes for Tailwinds, who goes for Bleak Wind Storms. We could see a taunt coming out, which could really throw Taran off and make sure there is no Tailwind coming off there whatsoever. But it is Rockside coming out through, so no Tailwind. So relying purely on these flinches to try and get through. <laughs> and both players relying on the possibility of flinches. See who goes through. There is one Bleak Wind Storm. It misses the Tornadus though, which is fine because Landris is really the main threat here. And we could still see that flinch. Oh, so there it is. Something clinch. that you hate to see. But that is, you know, it's as good as a Taunt. It's as good as a Bleak Wind. It's as good as a Tailwind. You know, they're not moving. You're getting a turn ahead of them. And that's going to be amazing for Alex going forward. Yeah, it's really interesting that neither Tornadus chose to go for a Prankster Tailwind that turn. So maybe, you know, both players realizing that the situation is mirrored enough that there's not that much point, but now the Tornadus is going to go for a Tailwind. Maybe not, you know, guaranteeing that speed advantage for Alex's Landorus, but the Landorus is going to miss the Rock Slide on the opposing Landorus, you know, dealing very little chip damage to the Iron Hands and the Rock Slide coming back onto the Tornadus, you know, heavily chipping it and the Tornadus, if it takes any more hits, unless it's a fake out, I don't think it's got that much long left on the field, but you know, Tornadus still being able to do really decent damage with the Bleak Wind Storm and you know, of course facing down very healthy Iron Hands is something he has to watch out for. He's got to watch out for the Iron Hands and Iron Hands is so strong that a fake out might get it, if not it's still a disruptive move, you still live on a sliver but you know, you're getting flinched and it wouldn't be the best thing to happen. We do see that switch out, so now I've seen that Landris Preservation game happen again, which is always really good to do in this matchup, especially when you see these two Pokemon right in front of you. Fluttermane isn't going to like if something goes into it from that physical side, but with the Intimidates dropped and the possibility of dropping further means it should be fine. Rockside coming up through, you know, it's going to get that, oh, it's going to get a Tornadus unfortunately, <laughs> and then we'll just see what comes from the Iron Hands here, because if you see a Heavy Slam with that slot on the read, that would be very good. It is only oh. a Drain Punch. So maybe just covering every base possible. Like, you know, there's two Pokemon that could come in. Heavy Slam gets one of them, but Drain Punch gets a few of them. And luckily, it was that situation. And with the Intimidate dropping, that Heavy Slam has become more of a roll. Some Flutter Mains can take the Neg 1 a Heavy Slam, some can't. So it's going to come down to see if Alex has got those EVs to try and preserve that game state and make sure that Flutter Main can do its most damage possible, especially with those choice specs, especially with the Terrestrialization still not used yet. Yeah, very nice switching on that Flutter Main, just, you know, absorbing that Drain Punch. And now, now that Alex has that turn of Tailwind, whereas Taran does not, he has the speed advantage. So this Landris, because it's choice scarfed, it cannot protect. So it either has to switch out if Taran wants to preserve it, or it's going to have to take a hit and get knocked out this turn. So, you know, Iron Hand's also not really that happy staring down a Flutter Main and a Landris at the same time. So it's you know, really interesting to see kind of how Taran will be able to pivot his way out of this if it does and there's that landra switching out taran just trying to preserve it and we're going to see the tornadoes coming in to take that very strong dazzling gleam 
Finesse is going to come in and try and take that Dazzling Gleam, but will it be enough to keep it sticking around? Of course, the Iron Hands does not like taking that Stomping Tantrum and will go down to his Dazzling Gleam as well. The Tornado just hangs on, which is going to be amazing going forward, because now you can guarantee something like a Tailwind or, you know, you know maybe a Bleak Wind. I, I think Tailwind is mainly the option you go for here, because you can't risk any damage, you can't risk the misses, and you can't risk maybe thinking Alex is going to switch up. Uh, on like a precaution. Even, you've got the Landris coming with a Choice Scarf, so it should be outspeeding this Flutter main, which means you can go for your own Rock Side, you, you can go for the Terra Blast, which we know knocks out from earlier. So it's just gonna be that reliance on where are your speed tiers lying? Will there be a switch, will not be a switch? And if you can cover all those bases by just going by Terra Blast, you catch the possible Urshifu in the back, which means that you can then get that to its Sash. And as we know from previous game, it's not the end of the world if that happens, but it still means that you can put it on its, on its edge and be like, okay, I'm not doing much now, I really need to do the damage and force those sucker punches where you can now play that mind game a bit more because you're not in that vacuum 1v1. Yes, and this Landorus on Alex's side is actually forced to switch up because it's locked into Stomping Tantrum, which is going to do zero damage against uh, both the flying types on Terran's side. And Landorus coming in, so the Urshifu is going to swap in, and you know Alex may be hoping that there isn't a double up into this Urshifu so that it can at least survive that one turn. Tailwind coming out, so Taran just guaranteeing that he does have the speed advantage, and we're going to see a Rock Slide. So you know Taran choosing to lock himself into that rock slide, maybe get the flinch, but Flutterman does not get the flinch, and Alex is going to take game three, so very well played. Very well played and very well adapted, you know, bringing in that Flutterman a little bit later, you know, making sure that it's not forced to switch out on that turn one, it's not forced to do everything left, right, and center do it. Flutterman does come in there, actually, so- Oh, I forgot right, there's one more Pokemon, actually. Here, but, uh, <laughs> Sorry. In this matchup, you know, yeah. you, you, you think maybe you can see, like, Flutterman can just go for anything you can maybe there's gonna be a speed tie but you can go for a sucker punch you can go for a wicked blow the sash is broken though which can be a bit scary because flutter main if it can get strong enough dazzling mm -hmm. gleam off so i do believe taran does have dazzling gleam on his flutter main so if you can go for one that's strong enough it is choice spec so they're both running that spec item it could come down to where it is so uh yeah, I guess that's the opposite of a caster's curse. I guess caster hype. You know, <laughs> yes, I completely <laughs> forgot Taran had one more Pokemon left on his team. He was like, oh, okay. He's taking the double knockout and then the Flutter coming come in. So, you know, Terra Fairy Flutter May is going to be doing a lot of damage. And I'm just going to have a quick look whether that's a Specs. Yes, that is a choice Specs Flutter May. So it is going to be doing a lot of damage. And maybe Alex just trying to stall out some turns of a Tailwind this turn. And, you know, Flutter May is, I don't think Alex's Flutter May can survive. I have a Terra Fairy from this range, and no, it is not. And so now Alex is down to his last two Pokemon, and we're going to see whether or not this Floodmane can clutch out the game for Taran. Taran is one of those players who can do anything with any tool you give him. And it seems that this tool is one of the strongest Pokemon in the game. Of course, Intimidate still doing nothing to this Fluttermane. But you now have to think to yourself that there is a possibility the Choice Scarf is enough to outspeed. You'd think players want to invest in that style of stuff. And you just have to rely on maybe enough damage coming from a Sucker Punch or anything coming out from this Urshifu is going to be enough to take it to range for this Terra Blast to do as much damage. You know, there's no defensive terror in this. It's purely offensive. Landris loving that new tool it's got in going for Terra Blast. I have to rely on Fly or any weird moves. Sucker Punch goes through. Does a large Ooh. chunk even to a fairy yeah. type. And then Dazzling Gleam goes before, though. Ooh, and that's going to get see. that Urshifu. Will it take out Landris? It and it does doesn't survive not. on any of them. <laughs> Oh, that was a very well played game from both players. In that moment when I thought Alex knocked out all four of Taran's team and then the Flood Me coming in the air. Oh, actually, Taran's still got that choice fix Flood Me. And he hasn't used Terra, so, you know, Dazzling Gleam, really strong. And, you know, Flood Me proving why it's just one of the best Pokemon in this format, both in both games. Like, game two, it was Alex's Flood Me going for that Terra Fairy and just sweeping late game, you know down to his last two and able to knock out all four and then there's Taran in game three just knocked down to his flutter main but it had the bulk and the defensive presence to just start taking all the knockouts so you know both players realizing that you know get get your opponent into a position where the flutter main can come in late game and just start sweeping with this choice spec dazzling and that was what flutter main does it just it sits there it sweeps it's showing, you know, finding faults in the team as they went on, maybe like knowing from maybe previous meetings between this style of team, the language is going to be slower than the Flutter main. You just kind of work out that information to get it through, but just showing how, how powerful it can be. Like, with, you give a Pokemon every tool that it needs, and it can do it, and that's what it's sat here since it came to us in Regulation B. It, I thought maybe it would drop off once we got something to do with a bulkier <laughs> Pokemon, but it just keeps roaring on through. It keeps doing its best to be the best Pokemon that is around, and of course, 
Saran paired with a great Pokemon is just a disaster waiting to have with all your opponents. Alex didn't fall completely, held that game until the very, very end. And, you know, we thought it was that, that guaranteed win when yeah. you had Pokemon on the field, but when you have a four times weak Pokemon, a Pokemon with not the best special defense staff, sack from that behemoth, it, it's going to be something that will drop and drop and drop. Yeah, a lot of Landris now, because of the choice staff, it does not have that, you know, uh, I think in Regulation D, a lot of Landris was carrying Assault Vest, and I think if Alex was really had the Assault Vest, he might have been able to survive the Battle Team. Of course, you do have to, as a player and team builder, you kind of have to take trade-offs, and, you know, so, so very well played from both players, and Karen just proving once again why he's one of the best like players in the in the in the country and you know just proving once again to defending our title of the MSS winner. So we are going to cut to a little break for the players to get ready for their next round and we'll be back very really shortly.
Welcome back, everybody. We are here in round two of the Orpington Saturday MSS. We have got two good, well, a team and a, one that is quite unorthodox. You know, we've got a Gallade on our screens on our little graphic here. Next to Josh Piercy, who is just going to be running your bread and butter hyper offense stars, Flutter Main, Roaring Moon coming back, which is something mm. you don't very often see. And they do also have Landorus, Iron Hands, a Golden Go, which is something you don't see very much either. And then Amoongus is here as well. So standard stuff versus just stuff that you see here so often. And don't let your eyes fool you. We do have an unknown on our graphic because Ogre Pond doesn't exist in our database yet. <laughs> so we're just having to make do where we are. So, you know, hopefully, you know, we'll see some fun action, especially like this Gallade, which I'm very, very hyped to see because you don't see Gallade very oh, often. Oh no. Especially with its new ability, Sharpness which uh, does more damage with its slashing moves. It's it's a weird definition, but we'll have to see how that goes. Oh, I saw the Iron Bundle as well. Like, yeah. That's something you never see anymore anyway. I am so excited to see the Gallade, and I'm hoping that Jason picks the Gallade. Looks like Jason is going to take his time, you know, go up against a hyper-offense team, and go, he, he's got a bit, little bit more off the charts. Enamorous with the contrary ability is quite useful. I see that it does have superpower, so every time it uses superpower, it's going to be boosting its attack and its defenses. So, you know, Jason running some really, really fun techs, and we'll see if whether or not this will do quite well against, you know, a little bit more of an, a standard hyper offense team. You know, Roaring Moon dropped off a little bit during Regulation D, but I think with a lot of Ogre Ponds running around in this format, that dragon typing is just really, really helpful, and access to acrobatics is just going to chunk all the Ogre Ponds for a lot of damage. It is going to absolutely, absolutely chunk them if it is that version, because of course it is just such a strong Pokemon. It's when you're facing into an unorthodox team, sometimes you just got to play with your best out possible. A lot of psychic types are here, so that Roaring Moon you know, is probably going to be very, very good to see. Enamorous scares off a little bit because it forces you to Terrastalize. And if we see what Terrastalization is, it is the flying type terror. So, you know, you can you can terror away, but you're still taking big chunks of damage from these Pokemon. As you see, it is in the lead, double Paradox lead, next to Iron Bundle plus Enamorous, which, you know, is going to be a very, very strong lead if you can activate it quickly because Bundle puts that pressure on for that fast pressure and can do a load of stuff. And an Enamorous can put pressure on in other places and see how that goes as well. Yes, and this Roaring Moon's attack is going to be heightened. So, you know, it's not going to be getting any speed boost from the boost energy, but that Roaring Moon without any Intimidate to slow it down is going to be hitting really, really hard if it can get an attack off. And Iron Bundle is carrying this uh, Icy Wind, so it can drop the speed of both the Fluttermane and the Roaring Moon. And it just ensuring that its partner Enamorous is able to get a, a, an attack off. But we'll see because both Fluttermane and Roaring Moon, uh, Roaring Moon not so much, but Fluttermane is quite bulky on the special side and Enamorous being a special attacker. It's oh, not, it's a oh no, it's attacker. a physical attacker. Actually, that changes things. So, you know, Fluttermane maybe not so, but Roaring Moon is going to switch out on um on Joshua's side just you know just foregoing that boost energy but Umunga's coming in a very good defensive switch into both of these Pokemon. Really good really defensive switch here it could just take hits from either of them like Amoongus isn't going to take too those ice type attacks, but if it's, it's a water type attack going to that slot, it's going to absolutely love taking it. And these fairy type moves coming out from Enamorous are going to be doing, uh, you know, given what it is, it's going to be lots of damage. There is an Icy Wind, so Amoongus can still take that fairly well. It's not the strongest attack, but Fluttermane is now going to be slower, which means that Enamorous can attack before it. And if Enamorous goes into it with a play rough, it is going to be doing a fair chunk of damage. So Sienna is going to that slot, and it does <laughs> get the knockout. <laughs> so that's something you normally see as a special attacker, you know, using a physical attack, and it's just well, nice to see players utilizing the physical side with superpower because you, you don't get the drops of your defense and attack, but you get a really good boost. So not good in front of these special attackers, but really, really good in front of a few fair other things. Yeah, and Enamorous also, because of contrary, is not afraid of the Landris. In fact, it's going to be very happy if a Landris switches in because it gets the attack boost. And, you know, I was actually quite surprised to see it hit that hard because I don't, I'm not too familiar with how strong Enamorous is on, like, the physical side. But, you know, they're just aren't that many physical fairy type attackers in this meta game right now this now Elamorous and Mimikyu are the only two I can think of Azumarill's there as well oh but, that's uh, right uh, <laughs> yes but Azumarill relies heavily on, on its belly drum or having something there to support it but uh and Amorous is just battling so I, I looked down at the team sheet I was like oh I know it's gonna be like you know maybe some sort of like specs version I saw it and I was like that's got play rough on it, and I, <laughs> I, I had to double check that, and I was like, maybe it was a last minute enamorous that they really wanted to our team, they couldn't get it done quick enough, but shows it is doing its job with something like a play rough, and you know, it has superpower, Tailwind to be supportive as well. 
we do see Ogapon coming in though. So Ogapon Fire has come to two of our matches so far, and yeah, hopefully it does a little bit better than that last sighting we saw of it. We do see a Terrifier coming out on the Iron Hand, so making sure that it's taking those players a little bit better if the Emirates had stayed in here. But of course, both these Pokemon are loving seeing it. Fake Out just to cover that water-type water, water type potential as well. And then it leaves a support coming from Moongus, but goes into the Ogre Palm, which is a grass type still, so it isn't going to be put to sleep just yet. A fantastic switch in from Jason, you know, absorbing that uh, Among Us sport, and I'm wondering, I'm just going to have a quick look to see if Ogre has follow me. It does have follow me, so this Among Us has to be very careful if it wants to go for a spore, because follow me is not affected by grass. It's, it's not like Rage Powder, and there we go. Joshua, go not Joshua, sorry, Jason, going for the follow me, and the Among Us <laughs> also going for Rage Powder. So a lot of redirections happening this turn, but of course, this is Hydro Pump is going to go be redirected into the Among Us, and you know, it, it takes it quite well, but you know, it's still a decent amount of chunk uh, chip damage, but now Among Us is going to eat that berry, so it looks like it's gonna be straight back to the same health as it was before. It's gonna go to a nice chunk of health, and it's gonna be in that in a weird position now where you know you're not really you, you can't ignore the ogre pom because it, it just ignores your rage powder unless it terrestrializes which, which it cannot do because of terrestrialization earlier so some people may see like oh, i know you terrestrialize your enamorous no now you can't terrestrialize your ogre pom put its fullest potential but jason here is seeing you know what i can still use as much potential as possible from this pokemon because it is now growing all these rage powders it's not doing much damage to every pokemon it's, it can maybe ivy sudge or into your so be hitting it anyway but it does mean it can be a bit of a supportive role. Amoongus switching out though is going to give itself a bit more time, get its regenerate, get its HP back. As we do see, it is the Roaring Moon coming back on in. So it's going to be putting, again, it's not like putting much pressure on. You know, it can go for its acrobatics onto this grass type in the in the Ogre Pond, but what much can it do beyond there when you've got a super strong ice type facing you down? Dray Punch comes through, goes in to protect. That is really the only contingency you have in getting rid of the Pokemon, of the Iron Bundle here, but if you get rid of Iron Bundle, Anamorous just comes back in, Anamorous can just start going for those superpowers, getting its defense and attack boost, and really steamroll from there if it's in that right position. And um, you know, with both these Pokemon being physical attackers, that is something that we don't want to see Josh falling into. Yeah, and the, uh the Among Us on that turn, I'm switching out because it didn't have Protect and looking at, you know, Joshua has already gone for the Terra, so now he does not have the Terra option left for this Roaring Moon, which would very much appreciate it against, you know, the, the Enamorous that's hiding in the back, but, you know, Iron Hands are really bulky Pokemon, and it is holding an Assault Vest, so I wonder if it's even been trained to survive the Hydro Pump, and here we are, the Hydro Pump is gonna connect and is oh. not enough to knock it out. Is enough to knock it out, but the Woodhammer comes in too and just misses the knockout. Wow. Ogre Pond showing that, you know, if it had just had that that boost from its translation, might be able to do it. Dragon Dance coming out though from the Roaring Moon, something you don't really often see because you often relied on your boost for energy to get as much potential in your speed as possible. Drain Punch goes into the bundle and is going to get all that HP back onto that Iron Hands. So Bundle being shown why it kind of dipped off in this format and the true Lord of the future is here. But again, that does just open room for something like that Namorous to come back in and just start steamrolling those boosts. And you know, you can play rough into the into the uh, Roaring Moon here and that's gonna drop completely. You know, there could be a miss, but that's something you can cover with that superpower. It's also super effective. If not, as we did see with the move hovering there, you, you can just go into the, the, the Iron Hands and get that get that boost rolling from the start. And even if you don't get a knockout, you still got something going for you, and that is really really beneficial, especially in this. I guess we're now in that late game, or at least one knockout has happened, and that means it can be very 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 strong once it gets bulky enough. Yes, yeah, so this Roaring Moon is now at plus one attack and speed, so it will be the fastest thing on the field for now. If Namorous does carry the follow, oh, sorry, not the top, the Tailwind, so it can. There's a potential play that uh, what Jason could do is go for Follow Me, maybe a Tailwind. I, I missed the what he had gone for the previous turn, but looks like now Acrobatics coming in easily enough to knock out this Ogre Pond, which you know did quite a good job of supporting its teammates and just making sure that its team can buy a turn for its teammates to set up and superpower coming in is enough to knock it out and now this enamorous in turn is going to be a plus one attack and plus one defense that's going to be very very good for it and I was thinking you know oh, enamorous is going to be weak to that wild charge that could come out but now that it's in a state where it's not going to be that, but a heavy slam comes through Ooh. and does loads of damage still so showing even that plus one that isn't 
going to be enough to outwit the power that it's Iron Hand. Faradraft comes in and can start throwing out damage. You can throw a Psychic move into the Amoongus and it can probably do a big chunk of damage. I know some Faradraft have started to go for that side Shock to hit into defensive sides, but it looks like it is just going to be a Psychic variant here just to kind of carry as much special damage as possible. And even with that Trick Room, which you could maybe go for normally with an Amaranth on the field, you're actually in a state where you don't want to be going for that just because both these Pokemon are two of the slowest Pokemon in the format and two of the strongest Pokemon in a Trick Room environment. So it's just going to come down to pure damage here and an Amorous Caster trying to get this knockout is plus one on its attack. It is on a low HP range on that Iron Bun, on the Iron Hands, sorry. So it could maybe get it from here. Iron Hands is a really bulky Pokemon, but then Amoongus could just put it to sleep straight away. And then you're in that case of, you know, Faradraff has to carry the world here. Yes, and Amoongus also carries Rage Paddle, which the Enamorous is not immune to because it's got Contrary instead of Overcoat, but Drain Punch coming from the Iron Hand. So, you know, Joshua predicting maybe just some sort of pr Protect coming off the Enamorous, doing a nice chunk and, you know, recovering of all that health, which is, earlier it had been knocked down quite heavily into the red. And now Amoongus are also taking a lot of damage, but now this Iron Hand is going to be recovering, looks like all the way back to almost full health. So all that work that Jason put in earlier, Earlier, just to knock it down ha has just been you know put, put to waste by this among us supporting its teammates so well it has been cut completely in the bin and now it's that case where Amoogus can go for those Rage Powders and control the field as much as possible. You can get as many defense boosts as you want but at that HP range and the typing you're not going to take a heavy slam. There is that Rage Powder it's just going to be able to you know, just control the field now. It, J Josh has just got Jason in a corner. Superpower is going to do minimal damage even that plus one yeah it's poison type it's a bulky Pokemon you know you get your attack boost again but what what is going to be anything from here. Heavy Slam comes on through is going to go through and break that. Amoongus might go down to a Psychic, but that's going to be a, a, a game state of like, can you then beat this Iron Hands? Iron Hands isn't, isn't the best with special defense, which could be a thing that you can maybe work with with this Farad Giraffe, but will it be enough to continue going on and on and on to win this battle in a vacuum? Yes, and you can see that this Farad Giraffe did manage to knock out the Amoongus, but of course, now it's Farad Giraffe versus the Iron Hands, and I think we saw actually Jason kind of recognizing that maybe you know, not wanting to play it out, and for a giraffe is not going to be able to take out this assault vest iron hands, which can just slowly recover health back through the drain punches for a neutral damage from all those drain punches. So I think Jason realizing that unless he gets really lucky with maybe a critical hit and a special defense block, and then maybe a critical hit the following turn, it's, it was very very unlikely that you know, he could have won that game, and maybe he wanted to just start focusing on game two instead and kind of be strategizing on the ways he can move forward, how he can take that game two and bring it into a game three. So you've got to think about that like through and through and maybe he was preserving information there. Like, you know, you had the hyper poison psychic, there was a chance that you had you took a few hits and you got the psychic special defense drop which could have carried through. But then there's relying on so many different factors like low rolls coming out of the iron hand, going for that going for those drops that he had to just kind of cover every base possible. And we've seen that the team has the potential to take out a, a super common team like this. Like, Jason wouldn't have brought it if he wasn't confident that it could do things like taking out these super strong Pokemon. Roaring Moon and I'm, and Roaring Moon, sorry, yeah, being quite unorthodox right now. Gordengo as well, also being a bit unorthodox these days, mm. you know, isn't really doing too much. Work, but... To see if we can break through that facade of these unorthodox Pokemon, because you know, both players kind of have that. You know, you have mm. your strong Pokemon that are common, some that are kind of creeping back, and some that are just you, you never really see. Like, I look at Jason's team and I think I've seen like two of those Pokemon in the ladder recently and that is just the talk on yoga pond the rest of them like i haven't seen them since like the start of regulation d and you know with the gallade as well you know you never see that unfortunately it's in a matchup right now where it can't do too much on the field but it'll be nice to maybe see it you know have a little salute on stream just to kind of give us a way to guide us through that show oh yeah Gallade is one of my favorite pokemon and i'm pretty sure since gen 4 it's been on every single one of my in-game teams but you know enamorous just putting in a lot of work that last game it was you know it was quite stopped by the among us but we are going to see a switch up from joshua leading the flood of may and they're gonna get my favorite a shiny <laughs> Gallade on stream i am so so excited it is a really, really good Pokemon to see, and it, you know, it's just, it's shiny, it's amazing, it, it's one of those Pokemon that is a very toolbox Pokemon, it's, 
you can go for a trick room you can go for damage you can you can do loads of stuff with it and it is really really good it's even got wide guard if, if we maybe see dazzling gleam as the option so it, it just it just covers everything it's so unfortunate that it's stats and you know just its usage really holds it back golden ghost switches out though maybe in fear of that wide guard so maybe it is now forced that you know you don't go for a dazzling gleam or 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 make it rain you just go for pure damage Follow me comes out so that if that single target move it is going to be going into that Ogre Pond who will love taking that move, but it is that Shadow Ball, unfortunately. So it's, it's going to do a big chunk. It doesn't knock Ooh. it out, but that does still mean that Trick Room is going up on this turn, which is massive for the Pokemon we see in front of us. Iron Hands will love this Trick Room, but Gallade is now loving it can sit in front of Slotomain and throw damage down on it. Yeah, so with the ability sharpness and the boost, oh, actually, this Gallade does not have a psychic move. It's got Sacred Sword and Night Slash. So actually, unfortunately, that Iron Hands is in a really, really good position because it's not afraid of that Gallade at the moment. And with the po Gallade's partner, you know, the, the Ogre Pond is a very hard-hitting Pokemon, but Iron Hands, I believe, looks like the slowest Pokemon on the field right now. So that Trick Room may be benefiting Joshua a lot more than it's benefiting Jason. Yeah, it's probably having the most benefit possible. It's just going to be working, you know, so so well. In in you know, it's one of those moves where if you go for it, you have to think: Is it going to benefit me? Is it going to benefit my my opponent? With a Moongus, with Iron Hands, you know, so many slow Pokemon, or even Pokemon that can happily pivot in in Trick Room. It's it just looks like Josh has been given everything on a plate. He has been given everything. He's been given the full meal here. A Moongus comes on in and is just ready to thrive in this environment that it loves to be in. Will Farajaf has that safety goggles can maybe work around things and go for those sidekicks away from the Amoongus, do anything it wants to. Sacred Soul does a chunk to Iron Hand still, which is a really, really rare to see because it's so, so bulky. So I have to see, can this be worked out to do more from this Gallade or is this going to be forced to go for these switches to preserve it and use it later on in an environment which is a little bit safer for it, especially now that we're in Trick Room with, again, those two really strong Trick Room Pokemon. Yeah, that did, that Sacred Soul actually did a lot more than I thought on Iron Hands because uh, in my head, always Iron Hands had pretty good defense. But of course, Gallade is a really, really strong attacker and the ability sharpness just boosts its damage output even more. Of course, the Gallade is not really able to hit the Among Us very hard because it doesn't have a Psychic type move. But of course, Freezeraft does have safety goggles, so it's not going to care about the Among at all and you know this ogre pond switching it maybe jason trying to sacrifice us so that he can bring in the torkoal that we got a sneaky glimpse of in the backs for those late game eruptions and you know terrifier eruption under the sun is a really really strong pokemon Paul puff the coming out does actually quite a reasonable amount to that frugiraf but you know frugiraf answering back with a oh with a forsaking to golden go which takes it very very well golden go takes it perfectly and just recovers it back with its leftovers and it's going to be so, so happy to be in this situation because it's not the fastest Pokemon and it's not doing overly well because, you know, you can... It's in Trick Room, it's locked into its position here. Ogre Pond can go for an Ivy Sigil into it and it's going to do a lot of damage. So you're forced to switch where you know that both these Pokemon can ignore Amoongus' Rage Powder and as well as its Spore. So you have to... We have to see, you know, Josh think, you know, both these Pokemon will be to fire, who is getting targeted. Spiky Shield does come out though, which means it is going to be preserving that state for as long as possible. But if you're in Trick Room, you really want to be doing something offensive. A Sludge Bomb Ooh. revealed <laughs> here for us. So this is an offensive Amoongus. Oh yeah, I totally... <laughs> I missed that on the team sheet. I was just assuming it was a support one, but you know, Psychic doing a lot to the Among Us, but of course the Ogre Pond actually has to really watch out for the Among Us. I first thought, you know, Ogre Pond is in quite a good position to be able to maybe get off an Ivy Cudgel, but you know, the Sludge Bomb the Among Us really changes things and Joshua just feeling quite safe going for a nasty plot on this Golden Go. And I think this is now our last turn of Trick Room. So after this turn, the the Trick Room is going to expire and that Golden Goat is going to be hitting very, very hard. Of course, it does have to worry about the Ogre Pond, which can go for the Ivy Cudgel, but of course, Ogre Pond is also quite threatened by the Among Us. It is threatened by Among Us, especially now we know that Sludge Bomb is active in play. And that's just showing what, what Among Us can do, like, especially when you have a tech like that, where you can put pressure on as many Pokemon as possible. Sludge Bomb goes into the Gallade deck takes it quite comfortably and Psychic should clean up the Moongus here, get rid of it. So now you can actually be a bit more comfortable with with the with the Ogre Pond here because it can come in and not be too scared of these attacks. Make it rain comes through and does just clear the field. <laughs> showing why this is such a strong Pokemon. It's not even one of those choice specs variants. It's no. just, it just cleaned up completely. And these two Pokemon that were very, very crucial to make sure that Trick Room is set up, make sure these Pokemon are happy and healthy, are now gone. 
So now you've got two really, really slow Pokemon, or at least supportive Pokemon, coming in in front of what can be a super strong powerhouse. And with Trick Room now ending as well, no way to set it back up again. Josh can just roam free on this field and do the best that they can to just say, you know what, here's some damage. Like, we can maybe see Goldigo happily switch out, get his stat boost back, and then come in and just start throwing down Shadow Balls or doing really whatever it wants to. It can go for a nasty pull if it feels safe enough. But Torkoal puts a little bit of pressure on there where it can still maybe sweep up if it puts these Pokemon in position where maybe they can not do enough damage to it or it can still out damage them. Yeah, the Joshua has played like positioner really, really well around the trick room, just wasting all of his opponent's turns. So I think, you know, Jason wasn't able to really fully utilize all those trick room turns, having to switch out. And I think the Sludge Bomb and the Amoongus actually proved to be really pivotal because if the Sludge Bomb wasn't there, the Golden Girl would have been a lot more heavily threatened and it wouldn't have been able to get that nasty plot off. But of course, because of the Sludge Bomb and the Ogre Pond being so heavily damaged, it would have been knocked out by that. And you know, both the Ogre Pond and the Torkoal in the sun, they will be doing heavy damage, but unfortunately there is a Fluttermane that also is benefiting from the sun. And you know, Fluttermane being such a strong attacker is going to be able to just pick up target and just knock it out. And you know, Torko without eruption and without Trick Room up isn't going is going to be moving last. It's not really going to be enjoying any sort of attacks. And we see that terrestrialization coming out onto the Golden Ghost. So, you know, Joshua going for the Terra Fairy, so trying to remove that fire weakness. We'll see whether or not it can survive this turn and get a really strong attack off. I see if it can survive through, but I just think it's not gonna be able to do it. Mm. Like you said about that flutter main, it is also benefiting from the sun. And that's one of the risks you run when you play play a sun team of yourself. You have to think, you know, is there gonna be these Paradise Pokemon who are also gonna benefit from it? And unfortunately I think it's like thirty percent of teams contain these super powerful Paradise Pokemon. Spiky Shield covers the base of if anything goes in there but i think if you're a josh you're smart enough to not go for those fairy type moves it is a shadow ball though so a bit of coverage there for that timing so to see how much it comes through from the golden girl who goes for a shadow oh, ball into see. the torkoal torkoal not known for the best special defense oh. just hangs on and goes to that heat wave <laughs> that animation is very long it and flutter main <laughs> avoids so to see if this gets the golden girl. if it does it puts a bit more pressure down it doesn't get it and it looks like Josh can just sit comfortably now. We know that Ogre Pond can't protect. We know that Torkoal, you know, probably is just going to be focusing on this damage or just is going to throw its flag in the air, wave the white flag around and say, this is it, this is the end. Of course, you can never say never in these situations, mm. but Fluttermane, even with those fairy tower attacks, I think might just pick up these two. And we'll call it a day going forward. And, you know, Torkoal, even if it does survive, even if both these Pokemon are fast enough to outwit both these Pokemon, and it's just going to come down to where predictions fall. Shadow Ball goes into that Ogre Pond there, and it looks like Josh is sealing up this game too quite comfortably. Yeah. All you have to do is his attack. Yeah, it was a very unfortunate miss from Torko. I think you know there might have been a sliver of a chance if Jason had managed to connect the Heat Wave, maybe gone a critical hit, because the Flutter Mains are bulky enough usually to survive a Heat Wave, even if it's a Terra Fire. But of course, that miss just sealed the deal, and you know the Torko, that poor little turtle at 23 health, <laughs> is not going to be able to take on a Golden Go and a Flutter Mane, which are both you know going to be faster and going to be able to hit it on its weaker special defensive side. Yeah, they're just not able to hit it whatsoever, and it just, yeah, it just gets ripped through. You have these strong special attackers, they're going to hit into these, into these, these weaker special Pokemon. And even in that situation when, <laughs> when Amorous was coming through, it wasn't really pulling its weight because we saw how much damage it took, even when things like Heavy Slams are thrown at it. And it's just one of those things. You, you, you can't rely purely on one thing. And we saw Jason was trying to be like, okay, if this matchup doesn't work, this matchup should work. And it went quite far, but then, you know, you have to use Trick Room into a team which has some of the perfect Trick Room counters on it. And it's, it's, it's just high risk, high reward. You have to think, my Trick Room Pokemon will be better than yours, whether they'll take hits. You know, Farrah Giraffe had to to all these Pokemon. But I think just seeing that Sludge Bomb really, really took the biscuit. And it was like, you know what, you can hit all my Pokemon for some sort of damage. You know, just to take the backseat to this prey. Yeah, among this, you know, when you see four moves, I slept off a little bit in the world because it's like still burning me. Yeah. There's a reason why Mungus is one of the best at free trick room in the first zone. And he's replacing a Mungus, which I haven't seen that often, but you know, showing if he did one damage and he gets to actually exploit off quite a bit with the pollen puff. So, you know, sometimes I think Joshua may show you that there's a reason why a lot of Pokemon like Flutter Main, Landorus, Golden Go, there, but Iron Hand, there's a reason why they're the most popular Pokemon to use because they're they're quite strong, you know, they're good generally into a wide range of teams, whereas you know, Jason's team, really cool team. I absolutely love it, but sometimes I think you have to be very situational in instances like you can bring it in. Yeah, it, it, it is very 
perfect situation and you like these sort of teams where you just have to find that perfect situation with perfect pokemon especially when it's such a niche team as well you got to think you know every pokemon has its role and mm. you got to think out when was it when is this role best adapt for like the enamorous you know obviously was there because they saw lots and lots of pokemon that either physically weak or physically offensive so if you can get those superpowers off you can keep the ball rolling you have Torkoal in Sun, which, you know, yes, you activate the Roma in the first game, but you can still do big, big damage to them. And then the Gallade, you know, was the icing on the top. It was something that I really was happy we saw in that game, but it was there for two turns, and it was gone. It, it pressed Trick Room. It can maybe press a couple wide guards to keep itself safe, but it just didn't really have that power and potential to go with it. And it, it's a shame it's gone out. Hopefully Jason can take it further. Maybe we see them get in top cut. Maybe Gallade will shine through. But of course, Josh just bringing standard stuff, bringing, you know, you know if it's good, it's not broken, don't fix it. Yeah, I'm really loving both their teams. So I'm hoping we'll see a little bit more of the way in the some you know, off meta Pokemon later on today. But we'll get our players are now getting ready for round three. So we'll be going to a short break and we'll be back with the next round. <laughs>
Welcome back, Pokemon trainers, for round three of the OP to MSS. We have an absolutely hyped match: Jamie Boyd versus Costa. It is the uh, the victory road Costa showdown. <laughs> I don't think say TV Sound Castle showdown now. Oh yeah. They, they they got onto the stream there in last turn, but no matter what their casting skills are, of course, we're gonna see what their Pokemon skills are today. And of course, they are whipping out every weapon in that arsenal today. Jamie Boy, of course, bringing typical Jamie Boy stuff. <laughs> Very similar to the team he le lent to Billa for Worlds this year. And we have Costa bringing a, a newer combo in the Ninetales plus Excalibur. Excalibur we haven't seen in a while. Ninetales maybe can help support it with its fast access to Aurora Rail plus setting up the snow. So let's see if that comes with beneficial. The rest of it is kind of just standard bread and butter stuff to kind of help the team go through. But then I look over again at Boyd's team sheet, and uh, there's something that's really sticking out like a sore thumb, especially when the sort of Megan we're facing right now. Yeah, there's a um, for Jamie Boyd's team. So, if, if for those of you who followed Worlds will know that for Worlds, he brought a Basque Legion team, and he, he's got an adaptation of that team. But instead of, I, for, I think he's got a Breloom, actually, that was the one. He stopped it out with a Comma O. So, he has actually double dragon, a Boy Moon, and a Comma O. But Comma O actually does quite well against Fluttermane if it goes for a defensive because the bulletproof ability I can just shut down Shadow Ball, which means Fluttermane is stuck doing maybe Dazzling Gleam to say, like, a terror. In this case, it's a Terrifier one, so you know, he has a very good matchup against Fluttermane. But actually, Costa's not running a Fluttermane because Costa's also running a really good team. Costa's running that cool team. Like, you know, the, the, I'm just looking back at the combo as well, and like, you, you were saying about beating a Fluttermane, I just saw it. Body press, iron defense. It's, <laughs> it, it's flamethrower, which are uh, oh, okay. a little bit scary. Like all these Pokemon, like I'm looking across the team, like Nine Tails, you've got like a flamethrower, like Scarlet, like a body press, Pika, like a body press, Rillaboom, like a flamethrower. Mm -hmm. Landorus kind of just can take either of them really if it if it wants to. And Ogapon being the Wellspring version can maybe take a flame, well, definitely take a flamethrower. But then body press comes a bit of a shaky situation because you're the most players only focus on special defense, given how special defensive it is, which would be nice to see. How Costa can really react to this one Pokemon, which has a tool for everything here. And if not, um, Boy is that sort of player who, like, every Pokemon will have a unique role. And, you know, Cobra can be doing one thing, and then that can be the threat that puts the damage down on Costa while the rest of them kind of do their thing. You're going to Grass Legion back out in the very end of the match and just go for those fast last respects. Gem Pal helps out as well, making sure that Body Press is doing more and more damage. And the rest of them, again, just sort of winning things. Like, we're not seeing any, like, Fallen Knees or anything coming off of this Ogre Pond, but it's just going to be a case of, you know, Kermo is purely relying on itself to set up and the rest of Pokemon to make knockouts. If not, you know, maneuver around it, make sure it is getting that set up. We go straight into what looks like to be the team preview. And, you know, Jamie Boyd doesn't really have opposing weather, so there's really nothing stopping from the Ninetales from just setting up that Aurora Veil. And here we are, we're going to go straight into the startled matchup with Roaring Moon and Golden Go versus Costa's Heatran and Landorus. So it's one of those matchups where. You know, all these Pokemon kind of okay to take them Like Landorus, happy to drop down that into the day on the Roaring Moon. Golden Go, you know, it can do a lot of damage to Landorus, but not to that Heatran, and Heatran can do a lot of damage back. As well as Roaring Moon, normally you're locked into like Dragon type moves, so, you know, that's not going to do much to a Heatran either. So Heatran in a perfect position given the Pokemon around it. So we'll have to see if that is something that can then be, you know, thrown forward as well. And we just see Magma Storm did just proc up on the Heatran, which is very, very good for trapping Pokemon, which means you can then maneuver around things. If you see opposing weather, you can trap them in, bring Nine Dales in. You can trap something that's quite a threat. Like if, if you trap in this Roaring Moon, it's got its attack drop until it finally fades away to switch out. So it'd be nice to see if Costa maybe opts around that. If not, you just got super effective damage going into this Golden Go, and you can maybe drop a burn onto onto the Royal Moon because that heat wave because that means that's then neutered even more and it just feels really really good for this lead and we see Landorus doesn't have it doesn't have earthquake so you're not really threatening yourself to do any damage it's just see a protector starting off this game yeah the golden guy choosing to stay here you know, it's a terror of steel so it can't even go for the defense of terror but you know Landorus is a choice scarf version so choosing to go for a u-turn not going to work and mega rain does come out does quite a bit of damage to that Landorus but the heatran of course takes a really well under your Landorus not managing to get that U-turn off, it means that it did get to be forced to stay on the field. And actually, Golden Go, even though not in the best position, dodges that Magma Storm, which is critical because Heatran is very high special attack, and it would have actually knocked out that Golden Go if it managed to land that Magma Storm. It would have knocked it out, and that would have been you know, a good step forward given how much damage we just saw it do. Like, especially with this team that Costa is bringing, you don't want that Golden Go lingering around because it is just going to throw steel type attacks into these ice type Pokemon. Landorus does get knocked out by a knockoff, which I believe is a move that Roy Moon only just got. Mm. I at least we haven't yeah. really seen it very often. 
and of course that just means that it's gone down and out and shadow ball comes out and we the life orb maker rain did a lot of damage and that's a, a decent chunk but not enough to really threaten this heatran heatran is showing how strong and bulky it is magnus storm going into a dragon type there is going to do uh, still a chunk as well and that is going to be that roaring rune <laughs> trap while well, the crit though did help and roaring rune is now trapped and cannot leave until it removes the heatran from the field or the timer on that trapping effect does end Yes, yeah, so that Landorus on Costa side didn't really get to do much besides dropping that Roaring Room down to minus one. That that U-turn got blocked by a Protect earlier, and of course the ro Roaring Moon on Boyd's side being booster energy speed means that it still outsped that Choice Scarf on Landorus. But now Rillaboom is going to come in, and you know it's not going to really. Oh, actually, this Roaring Room does not carry Acrobatics, so it can't really knock out the Rillaboom in one hit. And the Roaring Moon at minus one stuck in with Magma Storm, and a Golden Goat also at minus one special attack from that maker ring so you know both of Acosta's Pokemon are very healthy right now on the field and they're in a fairly good position you know, Golden Go really isn't going to enjoy being in kind of on, on the field right now and wonder if Boyd's going to look at you know maybe switching it out to reset that minus one special attack drop that might be what it is going to be wanting to do because Golden Go really relies on having a stats as high as possible in this matchup Roy Moon gets faked out there, so it's not going to do anything this turn. Not that it really has much potential because it is just becoming really a knockoff bot at this point to try and make sure that things are getting that item removed. And just going over and over again for those make it rains. We're just trying to, you know, just get damage off, trying to make sure things aren't in a composition. Heat Wave comes through though, and Golden Go does not like taking that. Roy Moon goes even lower down, and now it's even closer to that Magma Storm time and just ticking over it and over it. And Costa was making a very good situation of this. There was a lead that was a bit iffy given the Pokemon in front of them, but still really made the best and most out of it grassy terrain also is helping with like keeping this heat around alive even longer alongside those leftovers <laughs> so uh looks like we're gonna be sticking around this game with the heat trans sat here I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's there and being the last pokemon on the field even if it is like knocked out you know i think it'll still be there for quite a while yeah heat is that very unique fire steel typing is really really you know it's times for weak to ground but otherwise it has a lot of resistances basket legion coming in so you know it's now the last respects from that Basquiat Legion is going to be boosted up but because one of its teammates got knocked out. So I wonder how much damage that last respects is going to do. Of course, Basquiat Legion is not going to enjoy taking any sort of attacks from that Rillaboom if it does not manage to knock out the Rillaboom. And I'm just going to have a quick look at the Terra typing, which is actually fairy. So, you know, a move that maybe Jamie could do is go for the um, ter ter Terra option to maybe r remove that super effective grass type attack coming from you know grassy terrain boosted real boom so that's going to be hitting quite hard and here we are we do see the terror option I, I wonder which player has gone for it and it looks like it is going to be oh the heatran going for a terra fairy so heatran goes for that terra fairy and that just means it's going to take less damage from a potential wave crash or aqua jet coming out from the Basque Legion. Grassy Glide goes into the Roaring Moon, does get that knockout, just showing how powerful this move is. And I I can't remember if they nerfed it or not, but I think they nerfed it in some way. I but think the, they did, yeah. But the, the fact that it's still as strong as it was, and then the last respect goes <gasps> through. So maybe Jamie there was thinking about the possibility for Grassy Glide and was like, you know what, just gonna throw down this move that does more and more damage. Magma Storm goes on out, isn't gonna do much damage because it is a water type, but is all that still does a chunk, Ooh. just heat trap showing how powerful it is. And it is in a trap with that magma effect and it is going to chip away at it. So you've now kind of got like that back and forth of like you set up the grassy terrain so you're healing them, but Magma Storm is also chipping away, and where Heatran has leftovers as well, it's healing more back than the Magma Storm is doing to them. So it's like, okay, I'm getting HP more and more while you're losing it more and more. And that's just really nice to know, especially when this is locked it's locked into last respect, which is very, very good. But is it going to be a good enough position to break through things, especially though oh. with that Chen power coming out? It's going to be those last respects even stronger. And that makes that sticky situation more on Costa's side because you're now scared who is going to be taking this damage and who is going to be mitigating Basque Legion. And with no freeze dry, that is going to be very, very hard to take it out right now. Yes, this Nine Tails, you know, setting up the snow, which is going to help the Chimp. Of course, Chen power, all the ice types get a a 50% defense boost, which isn't really going to affect either the Chen Pao Rana, because both Heatran and Ninetales are special attackers, but, you know, Chen Pao is helping its teammate to just land those really strong last respects, and there's nothing on Costa's side that actually resists the last respects, which has been boosted up even more, because now two of his Pokemon, or two of Jamie's Pokemon, have been knocked out, so, you know, Ninetales could potentially go for an Aurora Veil, but I think at this stage, maybe, Costa's better off just going for damage because there's just not that much many turns left on the on the game. 
There's not many turns left, and with just how powerful these Pokemon are in combo, you know, you know what else are you going to throw at them? Like they're, they're going to throw so much at you that Aurora Veil won't even be a, a thing to them. Of course, that Trasterization does take away and those fire weaknesses, but it does it takes away the defense boost, but you don't really need that situation. <gasps> Nine Tails hangs on with that six HP, but then it's pulled oh. up into a knockout. Is there, and now it's a position where he Chan can't really touch either of these Pokemon anymore because of that Trasterization, because of their natural typing. Earth power could be enough. It isn't. It doesn't drop it. Magma Storm with the, you know, with the chip it's doing still won't be enough with the grassy terrain. And it seems that Jamie has just turned this matchup up on its head where Heatran was dominating. It's now in front of two Pokemon with two super strong attacks going into it. Especially now it's lost that weak, that resistance to the ice type moves by becoming a fairy type. Yeah, it's actually really interesting that the Ninetales survived that really strong last respect with a champ power on the field. So, you know, maybe possibly indicating that this Ninetales is actually very, very defensively trained. But of course, champ power's really strong ability just, you know compared up really well with Basque Legion just makes it really, really easy for Jamie Boy to take out all these knockouts. And Heatran, a really strong Pokemon, but it really, being so slow and, you know, being outsped by both these really strong physical attackers, it's going to really struggle to take the double knockout for Costa this game. It is going to struggle, and it's maybe going to have to rely on, like, a heat wave burn, if anything. Mm -hmm. Of course, Grassy Terrain still lingering means that there's still that one more turn where the HP is coming back when a mag <laughs> Magma Storm is trying to take away. And Chen Pao being there, just threatening with a really strong ice, uh, ice spinner, is still loads and loads of pressure. But now, now that we know that it's not going to be that Ice Could Crash, which is inaccurate, and you know, of course there's no Rocky Helmets to really be scared of, that you can happily go for something like that. Heatran is just relying on these turns sticking by. Costa can maybe go for another Protect to try and, try and time out these this terrain of course if you fail to protect then you know you have to then rely on not dropping to these moves but in the state it just seems like it is going to be that that drop that's happening and if it does then that is the case costa also biding his time trying to see if time is a way to work things through but it just seems you know it's going to be throwing caution into wind double Ooh. protect though is going to be very very beneficial for stalling out the terrain just a little bit longer which makes that chen pao a little bit more tolerable if you just get rid of yes. this Basque Legion. Yeah, so this Basque Legion is going to, I think, grassy terrain, I'm not sure. Oh, actually going for the Ice Spinner, but of course with the Protect, it does not remove the grassy terrain. So Basque Legion is going to get that one last turn of uh, grassy terrain healing, but Ma Magma Storm coming very, very close to knocking it out. I wonder how many more turns of Magma Storm this Basque Legion is going to be forced to be in. And he tried, looks like Costa <laughs> maybe just trying to go for that one last, you know, that triple protect so maybe if you can get rid of the Basque Legion through Magma Storm then maybe the Heatran can knock out the, the Chien Pao in a one-on-one -on -one format in a one-on-one -on -one battle I mean he'll have to that one-on-one -on -one, but it does seem that luck doesn't strike three times in a row and Costa is unfortunately going to be facing the wrath of these two hits <gasps> oh. uh, it's just that last respect that's enough to get the knockout there so Jamie taking that game one and just Flipping it completely, you know, showing that, you know, if you try and mess about in these sorts of matchups, you know, he is going to find a way to dig through it. And just keeping that Chen Pao to the very last second and putting it alongside a Pokemon that gets stronger and stronger with each knockout and then being like, okay, I can put each knockout, but I've also got the Pokemon that just reduces your defense stats, so I'm doing even more damage. And that is just a scary combo and just shows why he has been building teams like this because, you know, once you let that happen, there's no stopping it. Yeah, the stuff ability basculation is really, really strong because the stats ability boost the damage of your the same type attack bonus even further. And I think in the past, we've seen a lot of players maybe use Basque Legion or Swiss Bloom on a rain team, but then you're doubling up on the water type attackers and, you know, this Cloak Scarf Basque Legion is doing really, really well. And I think, you know, Costa, I really like his team. I think the Ninetales maybe came in just a little bit late in that game because he wasn't able to set up his Aurora Veil. So maybe an adjustment I would like to see is maybe leading with the Ninetales because there's nothing Jamie Boy can do against an Aurora Veil turn one, except maybe like, you know, double up into the Ninetales and hoping to knock it out before he can get an attack off. That seems just to be the real hope there is. Of course, the Golden Go being right there, like even though it might not outspeed the Ninetales, it's still putting that four times damage down. So you could get the Aurora Veil up, mm -hmm. but then you're not really going to take advantage of it too much. You have to see, though, what our players do adapt for in this next game just coming up for us. It's going to be nice to see what they go for. Because, well, you know, Costa could maybe bring that, that snow lead and just get that boost up right away. Jamie can easily retaliate with that Golden Go. I think Golden Go is just key in this matchup because you put that pressure on quite quickly. But it is actually Ogre Pond coming through alongside Roaring Moon. And we see Heatran and Landorus coming through again. So there's going to be an Intimidate drop on the two Pokemon that don't like seeing Intimidate. 
and Landorus, uh, Heatran, sorry, is now sat in front of a Pokemon which ignores its Flash Fire, which is going to be very, very scary given how powerful Ogapon can be, even at neutral damage. Yeah, so the, the Landorus is a very, very good lead against both of Jamie's physical attackers. Ogapon, being part grass, is not going to enjoy taking any sort of Terra Blast from this. Te oh, actually, no, it's a Terra Flying Landorus on Costa's. Oh, sorry, Terra Water <laughs> on Costa's team, and doesn't actually have. Um, Terror Blast, and actually we're gonna go, we're gonna see the Ogapon going straight for the Terror Fire. So it's now in, in its terror, the special terror form in Body Asset, which means it actually loses the Mold Breaker. So Heatran is once again going to be immune to any sort of fire moves, but Knock Off coming out from that uh, Roaring Moon is going to knock out the, the Choice Scarf, which means the Landros has lost its speed advantage. It's lost its speed advantage, but it's going to be facing the wrath of this hit. <laughs> and of course, the boosted critical hit rate coming out from that Ivy Sudgel and getting a knockout. One of his new moves, it's, they seem to love giving Pokemon boosted or guaranteed crit <laughs> rates right now. And uh, a 100 base power move with a chance to crit never misses is something you, know, you shouldn't really wave a stick at. So it's going to be down to this case now of, you know, you know, what happens from here. Costa has a few Pokemon to pick from, and a lot of them are looking like they're not going to be happy to see this Ogapon. Of course, it is Costa's own Ogapon coming in, though. So we're going to see the battle of the two types, Water Ogapon against Fire Ogapon. And, uh, you know, you'd like to say that the Water one would win because of the typing here, but I have to see what sort of pace Costa goes with. You know, you know we could see some burns coming out from Heat Waves onto that Roaring Moon. We could see Roaring Moon using Knock Off to take those leftovers away and making sure that he tries and healing as much as it was. So many options to go through that it just seems that it's going to come down to what tools they carry. And of course, this Ogre Pond is known to be a bulkier one just because of its ability. So to see if that bulk does come in handy in these next few turns to make sure it's sticking around long enough, getting knockouts, or maybe going for a bit of chip damage to make sure something drops. But Spiky Shield is going to hinder that for just one more turn. Yes, this Roaring Moon on the field, you know, it's going to resist both of uh, Breaking Swipe coming off. So try to actually... Did, did that actually go through the Ogre Pond, even though the Ogre Pond went for the Spiky Shield? I'm that was the opposing Ogre Pond used Spiky Shield. Oh, okay. <laughs> I just thought Ogre Pond used Spiky Shield. So, huh. did, has this Roaring Moon got a, a new Oshifu ability? But yeah, Roaring Moon proving that. You know, one of the reasons why it's so popular is... Oh, actually, I just thought I was too busy talking and I didn't pay attention. But Magma Storm from the Heatran actually missed the was the Roaring Moon that he went for. So that's really, really unfortunate. The Heatran, you're not really having a great time right now being able to land any of its Magma Storms. We saw in Game 1, it missed against the Golden Go. And it would have been quite useful against this Roaring Moon, just slowly chipping away its health there. But now, of course, with the miss, Costa is going to try and, you know, get the most leverage out of his Pokemon. Spiky Shield coming off from his Ogre Pond, just trying to you know, block off any really strong attacks. But Ro Roaring Moon, not falling for a oh. gritty cool hit on that Heatran. That poor Heatran is just you know, having a very rough time. But Encore coming out. Really interesting tech on that uh, Jamie Boyd's Ogre Pond, you know, locking his teammates into... Or locking the opponents into a move that maybe they don't want to be in. And, you know, of course, Magma Storm is going to be resisted, so he can't get hit super effectively by any Earth powers. Can't be hit by those Earth powers, but of course, you still do get that trapping effect. So it, it's, you flip a coin on this, you lock them into the Magma Storm, but you still receive that repetitive chip damage over time. And it, But even by doing that, like it's not the strongest or most accurate moves on its base, so you're going to have to rely on, like, okay, what pressure can I do with this? It does mean the Ogre Pond is now bound, so the opposing Ogre Pond can now go for its stab Ivy Sudgel to try and get some damage down and to try and maybe go for a knockout. These Ogre Ponds aren't known to be the bulkiest ones just because they are purely a fence. Maybe Jamie with the Encore version has gone for that bulkier variant though, just to try and like you know pull some strings, play things up. It's it's really hard to tell what you're gonna face into when you face into, when you face into Jamie because there's, there's so many different options that you can see. Dusty the Costa goes to rasterization to try and get as much damage potential out as possible. So we're gonna see the lovely blue flowing mask coming onto our field. And this could be enough to control the field a bit. You are gonna get a special defense boost, not that it matters in front of these two Pokemon, but it could still be good enough down the line, especially with the special Pokemon that are on Jamie's side. Yes, now the both are very special Ogre Ponds on the field. Knockoff is just not gonna do anything onto the water Ogre Pond, because of course its mask cannot be taken off, but it is going to get knocked out immediately by a wood hammer from Jamie Boyd's 
uh, ogre pawn. So you know, even though we thought they had the typing advantage because it went for the terror, it's no longer neutral. It no longer takes the neutral from the wood hammer, and you know, knocking out and he trying just land does finally manage to get that magma storm off. But unfortunately, it's resisted. Does trap both of its opponents in, but of course, he trying itself is also stuck doing. Magma Storm and with Costa down to his last two Pokemon, he can't actually switch out this Heatran to reset it and maybe come back in later on. So, you know, not Costa really not in the best of positions, just Jamie positioning so so well with the Roaring Moon and the Ogre Pond. This, yeah, this, that positioning is really, really well. And the fact that Pokemon haven't really been taken out right now and Costa is in his last two just shows how powerful these like more unknown combos can be. And Roaring Moon, where I've seen been picked up recently, where it's just it goes to those breaking swipes, chips down the team. If it's not getting the attack drop you know, purposely, it's still going for that chip damage, breaking a focus sash, allowing something to have that pressure on it. It means that it's doing such a good role. It is faked out though, which means it's not doing anything this turn. Not that it really matters what it does this turn, given what's in front of it. Ivy Sudger will come on through and go into that Rillaboom, and that is just going to be enough to remove it, most likely. Yep, yeah, it just drops, it's gone, and that just shows how powerful Ogopon can be. Heatran is now stuck in position where it's hitting for not very few fitter damage into both of these Pokemon. Magma Storm does go into Roaring Moon, that is the threat to try and prioritize, puts it further into that yellow, but isn't really going to be doing enough damage, especially now in that same sort of trap, I guess, where, you know, yes, Costa has got these Magma Storms set up, but at the same time has their own grassy terrain, healing the opposing Pokemon, and just going to make that timer go slower and slower and slower until a point where you know jamie can just take advantage of it and with it just being heatran versus the world we know both these pokemon have somewhat of a move that can hit into them and it's just going to come down to who gets it luckiest knockoff goes through doesn't do much for the item that's lost wood hammer it's going to be fairly resisted but it goes down <laughs> to that four hp and let's see how much this heat wave does yeah i always thought for a minute that maybe jamie would want to go for the encore to lock in because there's only three more turns of, of the teacher only has three more magma storms left, but you know, both his Pokemon actually surviving that turn from the heat wave, of course. Ogapon dodging it, but Jamie does still have Pokemon in the back and looks like I think both of his Pokemon are going to go down from the Magma Storm chip damage, but of course Heatran is now at four HP and it might regain a little bit more from the grassy terrain. But at this health range, I don't think the Heatran just has a very much time left on the field. Even a resisted hit will do very, very big damage against it. It'll do very big damage, and it's gonna come. Yeah, you know, it, it's on a sliver of HP right now, so it's gonna it's gonna be something. We'll look at it, and it's gonna go. Yeah, you, you could if it's that Basculidian, you know it's got Aqua Jet, you know it's got it's got oh. that choice card. <laughs> there, there it, it is. is. It's a uh, it can do any. It, it can guarantee one of its water type attacks are going to knock out. There's no scratchization. Golden Go as well can just go for you know its Shadow Ball and guarantee knockout. But Costa knows the writing is on the walls and calls curtains, and just thinking, you know what. Jamie, you've got this. These Pokemon are too, too powerful to break through. And going with a nice, clean 2-0. So that's another 2-0 on the books for stream today. And yeah. Jamie stepping ahead. Of two, you know, well -known players. That was such a thrilling match to watch. And Jamie, you know, positioning so well. That Encore on the Ogre Pond actually was a really, really nice tech move. And I actually forgot that Ogre Pond itself, even though it's a fire Pokemon, it was originally because of the grass fire type. It gets access to grass type moves. So it's not really that threaten as much but against a water type if you can get the move off first and it looks like maybe boys had saw this and trained his ogre pond to be faster than maybe the other ogre ponds so that it was able to take those knockouts and with the really strong wood hammer yeah that really strong wood hammer like even though it didn't get the knockout on the heat trans straight away it just shows the ogre pond is just one of those Pokemon you can't really let slide it's you know wood hammer it's ivy sudge or you know it has a move for everything and you can just not crystallize it and you can still get those things like those heat trans do still do big damage of them and it just put the pressure down and like all these Pokemon on the field, like you know, Woodhammer's going into that Ogre Pond, it's going into the Landorus isn't taking it all too well. You see Rillaboom, you can just Ivy Sudgel it, back Scalibur. It has its ability propped by Ivy Sudgel, but still does damage to it. Same with that Nine Tail. So he trans really the only thing that has a like so to say immunity to it. But you know, you can't purely rely on that heat trans we saw that it just gets left at the very end and then Jamie thinks one the other Pokemon wants to rip through it, and that's exactly what happened. Yeah, that was such a really cool match, but I'm really glad we got to see such a big variety of Pokemon with, you know, Game Boy really got known for bringing off metal Pokemon, but, you know, he makes it really, really work, and you know, I, I really want to see a bit more Basculation maybe later on in the game. So we are going to cut to a lunch break, so after lunch, we'll be back with more Pokemon games. <laughs>
back everybody to the Orpington MSS weekend. We are here for our fifth round after our long little lunch break and we have got an amazing matchup ahead of us. We have Oscar who has just come up from the senior division into the Masters after having a tremendous season leading into the World Championships last year and Matty Morgan who just came top eight in the World Championships this year as well as both these players will be facing each other in the World Cup in a few weeks time as they are both playing for Ireland and Switzerland respectively. It's so just like them. I'm looking at the team sheets for both of these players, and Oscar team really stands out to me because he's running the double bear combination: the Ursa Luna, the normal form, not the Blood Moon one, and Urshifu, the Dark Port version. Of course, you know, I think a lot of Urshifus there has been a bit of a switch from the Rapid Strike into the Single Strike, because Single Strike does deal a lot more damage, like straight up, and Rapid Strike Urshifu maybe. At the moment, just being scared off a little bit from all the overpawns we've seen running around in the format, which Matty does have. Yeah, Matty has that overpawn, and is that fire type one, which Urshifu in water type form does actually like to all, does like to play into because you can wait for it to crystallize and then do big damage to it. So it's nice to see how that adaptation works, especially because you see Urshifu dark a lot on trick room teams because it gives you a way to just deal massive damage to opposing trick room teams. You have a lot of psychic type Pokemon there. As well as just having something that deals not, deals fast damage alongside that plus main, which you do see a lot from Oscar's team. A little tidbit I did also hear is that Dragonite is a weird speed tier that not most other Dragonites are, are really going for. And some players have really been caught off guard by that when going into it in either Trick Room or Trick Room, because they try and play to it as they normally see it on like Showdown or on the in game ladder, and then they think, oh, this thing's faster or slower than normal, and then get confused by it. Whereas Matty playing a fairly standard team. Uh, the King Gambit is a standout, something that hasn't really been there since I want to say Regulation A, Regulation B. So it's going to be nice to see what sort of you know, strategy it takes there. It can also be a Trick Room Pokemon because it's quite slow, and it also doesn't take out Plus and Main if it gets boosted with its Swords down. And it's just really good there, and of course, other good things like I said about Earth Luna being there. It's normal form Earth Luna, we haven't seen the, the new Blood Moon yet, but it'll be nice to see if normal Earth Luna can pull its weight and really show why it's on those Trick Room powerhouses. Ursa Luna is one of the strongest like, tricking speakers out there. It is, it does need a little bit of a tank to help because, of course, it's holding the flame mode and it needs that. Uh, yeah, a lot of players, they do use Ursa Luna without the, the boost, like just turn one, get an attack off, you know, it's still a very, very strong Pokemon. So there's nothing wrong with just you know, attacking straight away instead of going for the second. Team Gamble over here, you know, that's a Pokemon that's been rising usage in regulation E because there's just so much up there just running around and you know Matty's King Gambit is pairing up with Black Glasses and I believe depending on how Elagnus is trained that King Gambit if it's Terra Dark can actually get the knockout with Sucker Punch on choice Garth Landorus. It'll be nice to see obviously Landorus is on Matty's side so no worry for that there but um, I do have our players are also getting ready to go into the game as well so I'll see what they decide to bring in this matchup as they do that. Of course, both these players really, really well versed. Of course, a trick room team going to what is a lot faster team that Matty's got. Maybe we're going to see Oscar knowing their lines into this. <coughs> sorry, into this style of team, and then it's just going to go, just go above and beyond, and really, really put that pressure down because it's not on those purely trick room teams where it relies. You know, it has to have trick room turn one to function. It's got so many fast options. It's got so many slow options with that earthquake as well in front of a lot of these Pokemon. Only really the Rillaboom and Landorus. You know can really avoid that earthquake that's gonna be really nice for oscar to know just just to throw that damage down and say his spread damage it's guts boosted it's stab cresselia is not being hit let's have a bit of fun there especially in trick room when both his pokemon will become slower and again only king, king gambit and i hands are matty's only real options in that style of play if that should be something that comes yes and it looks like both players have selected the pokemon for this game one and we're going to see very very shortly what they have chosen to send out and i think from a glimpse i don't think oscar picked the Ursaloon or the Cresselia during that team preview, of course, could be wrong, but Maddie is going to lead with the Rillaboom and Iron Hand, so a double fake out lead. And Oscar is going to lead with the Fluttermane <coughs> and the Dragonite. So both these Pokemon are going to be immune to fake outs, and of course, Maddie leading with a double fake out. So this <laughs> is going to be really interesting <laughs> to see how this turn one plays out. It's going to be really interesting. Matty probably just covering the bases as best as he can to try and say, here's these Pokemon that can put pressure with Fake Out. Of course, you've got really strong physical attacks coming out onto, onto especially that Fluttermane that has no defense whatsoever to it. 
It itself, though, has super effective damage to both these Pokemon. It will one these Pokemon in that Iron Hands. If not, it can just throw damage down as quick and easy as possible. So it could force the hand of a Terrestrialization. We do see that there's the Fire Type Terrestrialization on Rillaboom, which would take a Fair Type attack really well. And then Fairy Type Terrestrialization on Iron Hands, which isn't you know, as good at taking those hits, but it still shakes it from super effective to neutral. But by doing that as well, you can take a, you can take a Dragon Type attack from the Dragonite, should it have one. And of course, Rillaboom then becomes weak to some of those stomping tantrums, but does lose its weakness to a Terra Flying Terra Blast. Should that also be an occasion, but there is a to switch out that Rillaboom, getting it out of the way. Ogopon comes on in, which can take those hits a little bit better, but still can be a little bit scared of what this Dragonite can throw out. Yes, yeah, so Ogopon switching in is going to be quite a nice, it should be, I think you should be able to take some sort of attack unless the Dragonite goes for a Terra Flying Terra Blast. And we do see a Terra, oh, at the Iron Hands, going for that Terra Fairy. So, you know, just trying to mitigate as much damage as possible from a Splutter Main, which is, it's not holding a choice spec, it's holding boost energy. I think I missed what, uh, which stat it boosted up, but considering this Fluttermane does have Icy Wind, it suggests maybe it's a speed boosting. And Fluttermane just going for, you know, a Protect just to keep itself safe and Dragonite going for the Ice Spinner, getting rid of that grassy terrain and you know, a very nice, very nice turn from um, Oscar just making sure getting some chip damage onto his opponent. It is really, really good there. Of course, getting that grassy terrain means that Ogre Pond isn't doing as much damage and isn't getting that grassy glide activation straight away. You can still use it and still, you know, do damage with it, but it still it's not going to be that damage that you really want to be seeing from it. It's not going to get that priority. And that's just a good way as well. You covered hitting into that Iron Hands if that switched out. And then where it terrestrialized as well, it was really, really good to get a bit more damage on it normally would. Moonblast coming out though is going to go into it and does a decent amount of damage. Wouldn't have done as much, the more sorry if it was unterrestrialized. And the Ice Spinner <laughs> also just misses out there. As you see the Ivy Surger come out, this normally is enough to get most Flutter Mains and it is enough to get Oscars, unfortunately meaning that the Flutter is going to go down straight away, and it's just going to put him in a position now where Oscar can bring him on these Pokemon that can do a lot of damage alongside it. Dragonite, though, gets put down to below half from a Wild Charge, which is actually neutral because of the Dragon typing, but also does cause this self-knockout in return. So, state of the field, you take a piece, you lose a piece, and yeah, it's going to be both of them bringing in a new Pokemon to see how they can adapt to this. As we do see, I think that is the Iron Hands now coming in just to replace the Flutter Main. And now you got that defensive point to pivot around with. Yes, and I, you know, I think that last turn where Oscar traded his Flutter Main for his opponent's Terra, you know, maybe he thought that that was quite a nice trade because now Matty has lost his Terra option and Oscar still has his. Of course, the Dragonite is heavily chipped. This is an inner focus Dragonite, so it won't be flinching to any sort of rock slides, but it does mean that we actually saw in that last turn, it did take the normal amount of damage from that Wild Charger. Now, this Landorus coming in, that is a choice Scarf Landorus, so it will be going faster than anything on Oscar's team. That Dragonite is also a choice Bandit, so it cannot go for an extreme speed. So if Oscar wants to reset his Dragonite from, and prevent from using Ice Spinner, He's gonna to have to switch out because I don't. If uh, if the rock side connects on this Dragonite, I believe it'll be knocked out. It, it should do from that range. Like Landorus is a really really powerful Pokemon, and some people opt to have a little bit less attack in in, in his physical investment just to make sure you can get that speed and that HP. But uh, unfortunately, it's faked out there, so we'll never know what it would have gone for. It's a follow me comes through from the Ogre Pond, making sure that it's not getting anything thrown further onto that Landorus. Ice Spinner comes on through so that a fire typing will help a little bit on Ogabon, does a decent chunk and means that it's going to be sitting still quite healthily and now Landorus can still go for those rock slides, Ogabon can keep going for those follow me's and make sure that it's not being targeted as hard and isn't really having that pressure and now it's just going to be a back and forth of you know can Oscar maybe work around this, will it be a high roll on that Ogapon? will Ogapon maybe go on the offensive this turn to try and catch things out and that's one of the things I'm really loving seeing from Ogapon, especially since today, where it can change up from a physical attacking Pokemon that's doing a lot of damage, or it could be a supportive Pokemon that is really playing that mind game. And no one knows what we're going to go for because it's one of those Pokemon that can do both at once, which is very, very rare to see in like the newer versions of Pokemon. Yes, we've seen quite a lot of different Ogapon sets today, and I think this one from the looks of you know taking this took quite took that Ice Spin off from a Choice Band and Dragonite quite nicely. So you know, also the fact that it can use Follow Me kind of leads us to believe maybe this. This is more of a supportive defensive Ogapon and rocks are coming out and it does manage to miss or Dragonite manages to avoid it. Does very little chip damage to the uh, the Urshifu but Ice Spinner coming out of course no longer at minus one attack because Dragonite's got inner focus is easily enough to knock out this Landorus which is times four weak to the Ice type. Leaving the Ivy Cudgel, uh, leaving Ogapon to use Ivy Cudgel which oh the Urshifu does survive quite quite well. 
Ursh was sized really, really well, and that's, you know, it's just one of those things that Ursh was showing is a little bit of bulk that it normally has, as well as just the, the lack of that boost from the crystallization on the Ogre Pond. Not really helping it too much, but it's still doing its bit. It's still done that redirection. It kept Landris around a little bit longer. That rock side probably missing didn't help in the scenario where you can maybe take it that step further and go above and beyond and just control that field. Because once if there would have been that switch in, you would have got in some you would have got in that iron hands, which wouldn't want to take a ground type attack. And so you could have just switched out, come back in, got the intimidate drop and just spammed those until something dropped. But of course now it's a bit of a situation because the Dragon Knight is still going. It can hit both these Pokemon for a really, really big amount of damage. So as Urshifu is helping a lot there as well because you can go for a Sucker Punch to, to break through things. And we see it terrestrializes, maybe to get more, and it is that Dark type, so it's going to get more damage down regardless of who it goes into. Yes, Terra Dark Urshifu, as we've seen from earlier formats with Terra Dark King Gambit of Black Glasses, is a very, very strong Pokemon. Grassy Guy coming out, times for Resisted on this Dragon Knight just really isn't doing anything, and now Urshifu going for that wicked below. Terror Dark is easy enough to knock it out with a guaranteed critical hit, which of course I don't think even without the critical hit it would matter because Urshifu is really strong and you know Terror Dark. But Ice Spinner once more coming out from this Dragon Knight, super effective on this middle move, knocks it down into the red. Of course, more critically, getting rid of its grassy terrain so that there's no more priority grassy glides from this real boom or any boosted grass type damage. So, you know, I think Maddie, that was very unfortunate when he missed the rock type because that completely turned the game around but Oscar also played really well pivoting defensively you know recognizing which Pokemon to preserve which Pokemon to knock out and looks like Oscar is going to be taking the game one it does look like Oscar has that game one and in an amazing fashion as well it like it's one of those games where it could have been anyone's game for all throughout but then that change up towards the end Dragonite dodging that rock side didn't really help and it really did put a bit of a spanner in the works when it was a case of okay if that was gone then you could have or at least strong into these Pokemon, especially with the Pokemon throwing them out, would have been at Landorus. But it's, yeah, that is just how the cookie crumbles sometimes. It'd be nice to see how the players can pick up these pieces. Of course, hopefully Matthew doesn't lose, like, get under his own skin and think, oh, you know, I lost because of hacks. This is, this is the be all end all. Because, you know, looking at it, that situation was winnable. It just came down to that very, very last minute where, you know, whoever went for it got it. And unfortunately, Oscar's the one who could take it that step further and go all the way. Yes, a 90% chance to hit. It's actually not that much to think about because that's one out of 10 times on average that he will be missing an attack. And, you know, both these players are very seasoned and very experienced. And so I think, you know, Maddie, of course, having just gotten top eight at Worlds, probably knows his adjustments. And he's, I don't think he is the kind of player to let that kind of you know, bad luck kind of affect his portfolio play. So I'd be really, really interested to see what sort of adjustments both these players make or whether they're just going to keep to the same uh, Pokemon that they pick. Because, you know, Ursula and Cresselia on Oscar's side, that is a very strong combination, but Oscar didn't choose it and he still ended up winning the game. So, you know, proving that you don't have to go with the Ursula and Cresselia in a tr heavy trick room team. Yeah, you don't really have to go for it. I think just the style of team that Matthew is offering up and just in front of it really makes it horrible. Like, like we said earlier, like the Rillaboom doesn't take much damage from Grass type, so you're, far, you're forced to go for that facade. Landorus doesn't doesn't take any damage from those, from those earthquakes. Again, you're forced to that facade. Ogre Bomb being part Grass type is kind of okay into those into those ground type moves, but again, forcing the facade. There's only two Pokemon that are going to take super effective damage on that. A Flutter Main, you know, you're forced, it's the other way around, you're forced into those stress moves. It can be a bit iffy if you're facing into it and some of your Pokemon on the field don't want to be taking that earthquake. So it's just safe to leave it at home and maybe bring it in game two when you can force Matthew to be like, okay, they didn't bring it in the game one. So just, you know, don't bring Rillaboom at the start or don't bring it whatsoever. And those Pokemon can't be at all unless, you know, can just run rampant. You can, you can see something like, you know, one of these strong Pokemon like Urshifu or Dragonite next to the Cresselia, guaranteed Trick Room up. Then they can both drop because they're sometimes just which will allow Earthloon to come in within the Trick Room environment and then just start throwing its damage down. Again, same with Iron Hands, you can fake out Trick Room, switch out, come in, and you guaranteed to get your Flame Orb at the end of the turn, which means you're going into the Flame, they're going into turn one of Trick Room with your Flame Orb activated and Gut activated, and there is that lead, the Dragonite plus the Grisselia. So we'll see if this is going to be that strong combo of forcing down the Trick Room as quick as possible. Yes, that Dragonite is looking very happy against the fake out user and an Intimidate user because its ability in a focus prevents 
prevents any sort of flinching or any sort of any intimidating attack drop. So, you know, Dragonite is in a position to deal a lot of damage to the Landros. Of course, Landros is going to be faster with that Choice Scarf, so there's nothing stopping it from going for, say, a U-turn into the Cresselia. And Cresselia, you know, being a Psychic type, is going to take super effective damage from a U-turn. And we've seen a lot of times on previous streams where, you know, some Cresselias, depending on how they're trained, might actually even take more than half damage from a U-turn. Yeah, that's very, very unfortunate to take if you take that much damage. But you see it's the rock side that comes out. So try and maybe just to flinch the Cresselia. Of course, Matty is, is playing without the knowledge of what is in the back. We you see Tom return just half of that health. But oh, but there is that crit. So avoiding a potential trick room had that had gone through. And a wild charge goes in and gets that dragon out. So that may be another calc as well where Matty knew that the rock side plus wild charge was enough to get knockout on most Dragonites. As well as you cover that basis of because of that you know, that lack of knowledge of what's in the back, you can stop a trick room. So if Ursula wants to come in, you're at least stopping it in its tracks before it can become a damage dealing threat. Iron Hands coming in though will still kind of like Trick Room, and it comes down to that mind game of which Iron Hands is faster, which one is slower. Moonblast can maybe pick it up or put it into a position where it's low enough to you know kind of be ignored for the rest of the game. Depends what sort of you know, area they go for and of course you know if Matty can just keep getting those rock side flinches of that trick room up even though it's going to be doing very little damage it is still something that can carry out the rest of the game and allow for that steam roll then bring something in when both of these pokemon that are threatening the field are gone and can just you know take out these more fragile pokemon before the bulky ones come back in yes yeah, landorus is going to withdraw this turn maybe Matty not really wanting to use rock sides anymore because it's not going to be doing that much damage to the iron hands or the chrysalia yeah? and at that point you'd probably be only using it to try and fish for a flinch so Matty sign maybe he wants a harder hitting pokemon with a real boom coming in grassy glider now that the dragonite has been knocked out it cannot go for an ice spinner anymore and there's no more switching of terrain which means also that maddie can preserve the landris and switch it back in a, a double switch for maddie you know the Fluttermane also coming in which is going to do very very, very nicely against this moonblast and you know chrysalia just not a pokemon that's known for having a really high special attack so it's it, and Fluttermane being quite bulky on the special side is going to take that quite nicely it is going to take that very nicely like worst case scenario is like matty well matty went for that switch and it just covers so many things the fake out became ignored because of that and also you have that case of like you know you're not taking super active damage from the moon blast worst case scenario is that the special attack drop happened but luckily that did not happen for matty so he can he can live happily knowing okay yeah i'm getting my fullest damage output from this from this turn of having flutter mania which is really really good into these pokemon on the field because you can now have that state of you can force a terrestrialization from ivy's pokemon to take a shadow ball or moon blast respectively but then the one that doesn't terrestrialize can take the full brunt of it resuming blast going to cresselia though and it does get that unfortunate pressure attack drop in return which i which would have been good earlier and then woodhammer goes on through and gets that <laughs> knockout so amazing double up so to see what the iron hands can deal with from here you know it can maybe get rid of the flutter main if it went for that heavy slam because most time you can get a knockout from here unless it's one of those bulkier ones it's not one of those bulkier ones and it does get knocked out so again it's a pokemon for pokemon trade like we saw earlier in the game so we have to see what these last pokemon are that can pull out the, the first potential iron hands is kind of okay in this situation. Landorus is going to drop its attack stat, which is a bit annoying for it, as well as having those stab super effective ground type moves into it. But, you know, maybe it's bulky enough to take a hit. Depends how these, uh, this la this Iron Hands is built in comparison to a Landorus. Yes, this Urshifu is going... Both these physical attacks are going to be at minus one from that Landorus, which is, you know, very happy to switch it on those. So Iron Hands probably not too happy about the attack drop, but Urshifu, it's... Wicked Blow is always a guaranteed critical hit, so it's not going to care too much. And at this stage, you know, I don't think, even without the Intimidate, that Sucker Punch from Urshifu is probably not going to knock out this Landorus. So Maddie also has not gone for a terror. In fact, I don't think either player has gone for a terror. So, you know, th this Landorus can just go for a terror blast. Terror flying? Yes, it does have terror blast. So, you know, very, oh, that, that would have did a lot to that. Oh, that was not a Warhammer. That's, 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 stomp, a that's a double up. So very good prediction from Maddie there, just calling that there's going to be a detect coming off from the Urshifu and just doubling up into the Iron Hands. Yeah, getting that double up and just rem removing it from the field. It was one of those Pokemon that, you know, regardless of what sort of state it was in, it could put threat down somewhere. Because even though it was neutralized with that Intimidate, Drain Punch could have gone on and on and on to make sure that it lived for as long as possible. Landorus would have got rid of it eventually because it can't really target Landorus. It's immune to its wild charges and it's got a bit of resistance to its Drain Punch. So it would have been a long and tedious war of attrition if that had happened. 
The Trasalization here on the Urshifu could maybe be useful. You could start throwing down enough damage to put the pressure on. Stormy Tantrum does come out though and does put it down to the red. So the Seeds of Wicked Blow is enough to get the KO. You can see who they prioritize in going for. Is that Landorus who doesn't <gasps> drop? And now it's that unfortunate case of Grassy Glide is going to be active still. Landorus, yeah, it's locked into that move so you know who you go into, but all we can go for is like maybe waiting for Grassy Terrain to heal up and up and up until you can knock out of being knocked out yourself. Yeah, I have to say I was very surprised to see that Landorus survive. This is a terror block, a terror of dark. Urshifu going for a critical hit with Wicked Blow. It's just showing that, you know, Landorus can be trained. It's not off it's often perceive as quite frail because it's got a times for weakness to ice but when it takes neutral hits it can actually survive quite a lot and you know Urshifu getting that one little tick of health back from the grassy glide but it's only got single target moves and it's chipped enough to the point where any strong attack should be able to knock it out so it looks like Maddie is going to take this game too and we are going to go into a game three. A game three it when you play against Matty, you got to expect these are sort of things you're going to be seeing. Going to a game three, especially after that sort of adaptation that happened, where where they, they played more into, like, okay, you know, I can go for that rock side, I can go for the double up, I can make sure things are going down. And he played a lot more braver than he did in that first round, where in the first round he's kind of been a bit like, you know, stepping back, maybe, like, okay, I could go for this, but let's go for the more predictive plays. But this time around, it was throw damage down, throw caution into the wind, and try and get some damage, down, damage as quick as possible. And it really worked. It does that knockout pretty much turn one on the, on the Dragonite. And then from there on out, it's just double up after double up to make sure something was gone. And when you're left with just an Urshifu against two really, really strong Pokemon, then it's just a case of, you know, Urshifu has to hope with the highest of high rolls on both of these Pokemon. But then when you add Grassy Gliding into the equation, it becomes even harder. Yeah, really good adjustment from Maddie in that game too. In game one, you know, he like, Dragonite was doing so much damage and he like, stayed on the field the entire time using nothing but Ice Spinner, getting rid of the terrain took a lot of knockouts and Maddie is useful in that game too just prioritizing that like getting rid of it turn one didn't know what to deal with that choice and ice spinner and once the Dragonite went down which I think is a key component of Rox's team the rest of his team wasn't able to handle or all the you know grassy glides the real good wood hammer I mean hitting really really strong and you know Landorus was then able to come in and out and throw down intimidate which none of the rest of these Pokemon were immune to yeah they were they weren't immune to the they were only dragon that was immune to that and they could just keep looping and looping. The only Pokemon that really care about that is the plus domain of Cresselia outside of the Dragonite, but when you're not bringing those much possible, like Cresselia, like we say, isn't the strongest special attack, it is just very supportive and it happens to carry a move that can do damage. It is going to be that case of, you know, what do you do from there? If you, if you can't do anything but, you know, support, you know, you can go for Ally Switch to kind of control the field a bit more, you can go for Lunar mm -hmm. Blessings to heal up, but then, you know, when you're in a point where you have to go for that damage to try and do something, you know, that is stuff on yourself, but I'll just see if any further additions come in this game three. Oscar doing very, very well to come through into this game three, showing that you can come up from seniors to masters and still dominate the field. And then we have, of course, for both the players bringing up their flood domains turn one, which is <laughs> always a mind game. And then we have, of course, the Dragonite coming again in front of the Iron Hands and knowing flood domain to Dragonite, we know how this normally goes, as well as knowing how much the wild charge can do after a bit of chip, maybe. Oscar knows what to do from there as well. Yes, this Dragonite is not a multi-scale one, so it will be taking super effective damage from the Fluttermane if it does not choose to Terra, but if it does go for a Terra, this is a Terra flying one, so it will be taking super effective damage from the Iron Hand. So, you know, Dragonite may be not looking to be in the best of positions right now, so I wonder if Oscar is maybe thinking about either switching it up or going for a Terra Blast, maybe trading the Dragonite for a Fluttermane, because Maddie's Fluttermane is also choice spec, so it cannot go for a Protect so there's a very, you know, you can double up into Thlum or just attack it and if the Thlum doesn't switch out, it can get knocked out by a Terra Blast, Terra Flying from that Dragonite. So we do see a terra Terrastalization turn one of this game and it is going to be that Dragonite. So Oscar just wanting to make sure that the Dragonite is going to survive a super effective fairy attack. It is one of those cases where you're again forced into Terrastalization just to try to guarantee taking that hit, but at the same time you take even more damage from this Iron Hands because it is now, you're, you're losing the Dragon typing so it's doing even more damage. We see the Terrastalization coming out from Matty's side as well, t turning into that Terra Fairy, so you can take less from those Fairy type attacks, but you also now will take more from those Flying type attacks because you've lost your Electric typing. So both these players have been had that mind game force where they have to change their types to take one type but also you become weaker to the other but it is also just one of those things that happen in Pokemon.
on Dazzling Gleam, as always, does loads and loads of damage, and the Stomping Tantrum goes into the Iron Hands, puts it to 50%, but then the Wild Child comes back from Retaliation, and it's the same as we saw last game. Double up into that slot, get rid of it with the Iron Hands, and then now that Dragon Knight is gone, one of the strongest offensive pieces in Oscar's team has been removed and has to rely purely on you know, what is on the field. Now, we do see that it's Flutter main, so it's not going to be the end of the world if that trying to pull itself through. But, you know, when you've got Iron Hands in the back and an Urshifu, which isn't going to like either of these Pokemon right now, it is just in the hands of that Flutter main, and you know, it can only do so much with how fragile it is. Yes, this Iron Hands is actually in relatively good health, considering it took a Moonblast and a Terra Blast. Oh, oh no, it was not Terra Blast, it was a Stomping Tantrum, of course. I mean, a really good defensive ter Terra coming off from Maddie, and Flutter main, you know, managed to escape that turn on Maddie's side completely unscathed, because it was not targeted down. So maybe Oscar not getting the best of trades in that last turn, losing his Terra and the Dragonite, and not really doing as much. But of course, now his Fluttermane is the faster one with the Icy Wind dropping down speed. So Maddie's Fluttermane is going to be put at minus one speed. And I wonder if the Urshifu can knock it out with that Wicked Blow. Oh, it well, does. It's enough. But yeah, it's, it's enough to get it. And you know, now it's that same case we had with Matty going on to Oscar, where it was the, you know, getting rid of the Dragonite meant the offensive presence is gone. But getting into Fluttermane, you know, even though Matty's team is very, very strong all around, you have still got one rid of one of the Pokemon that was threatening a lot of your Pokemon, like Iron Hands and Urshifu. And Urshifu can now sit very, very comfortably because the thing that was throwing super rate damage under both of them is gone. It's removed. You can fake out things. You, you know, there is that rid of it bringing the fake out. But if you can call that fake out right of who it's going into, you can completely stop a turn from happening and allow Urshifu to throw damage down. It is annoyed a little bit by the Terra Fairy right now on this Iron Hands as well as its massive defense stat. But as always, there should be a way around it, such as the Iron Hands itself going for a wild charge, and you can double up into that slot and leave Rillaboom until later, which you know you can sort out. Yes, Matty's Iron Hands is also heavily chipped, so I, I'm actually very curious if a resisted Wicked Blow close combat going into it is oh. not enough to knock out this Iron Hands, and now this Urshifu has had its defense and special defense drop. Of course, it is holding a Focus Sash, so it won't be knocking out, and of course, the Iron Hands on Oscar's side is going to get a uh, Drain Punch, so, you know, helping uh, Matty's Iron Hands regain some health, but it does look like this Iron Hands Ooh, I don't, I don't know, I think it might. Depending on the roll, I think it was slightly uh, slightly more HP, so it looks like the Urshifu should be able to knock out the Iron Hands this turn if it chooses to target it. It should be able to do it, and you know, <laughs> it's going to get closer and closer every time, but it is just one of those things, because you can see the Heavy Slam is like a super effective option, but with how do both these Pokemon match in weight, that, is gonna be, that damage can be drawn back completely. Protect is the option on that Urshifu, uh, just making sure it is nice, happy, and healthy on the field. Grassy Glide does opt to go into that slot, which is really, really good, because you can heal, you can make sure that the Sash is still intact, especially when you've taken the defense drops. Wild Charge comes through, goes into the Iron Hands, does get that knockout, so it's taking out one of its own to make sure that it has got that steady pace going forward. And now we're going to see what came in the back for Matty, because Rillaboom isn't going to be able to handle this by itself, because yes, it's taking less damage from what's two of the major stabs from, from one of these Pokemon, but it still is pressured, and it is that land was coming back in, so Intimidate is going to be dropped, and it's going to mean that Urshifu is going to rely purely on its Wicked Blows, which as we saw last game, isn't the most reliant thing, especially in this late game against two Pokemon that are known to be bulky. Yes, in that last game, we did see that Landorus was able to survive a Terra Dark Wicked Blow from this Urshifu, so it's very, very unlikely that... Oh, actually, it's impossible for this Urshifu to knock it out because Wicked Blow was always going to be a critical hit in, in that last turn. If the critical hit didn't knock it out, it wouldn't have knocked it out anyway. And Glassy Glad coming in, just doing some chip damage onto this Iron Hands, and Maddie once more targeting the Iron Hands, leaving the Urshifu open to actually deal some sort of attack so you know maybe Maddie predicting a detect coming off from Oscar this turn but it does allow the Urshifu to get a wicked blow off and also keep his focus sash intact. That is very very well played there because now Oscar is in a position where he can force the sucker punch he knows that Landorus cannot do anything but attack so he can just keep forcing that sucker punch opportunity as and when he needs it. Protect is useful because it you know, again it allows you to keep your focus sash intact see what the Pokemon are going for see what's playing through and it is kind of a bit of a dichotomy because if you let the grassy terrain go, you're not going to have that healing that is going to keep your sash as close to intact as possible. But you also stop that real boom from going before you, which can be very, very good if you start going for those sucker punches, the wicked blows again. And that can be something that can be you know, a tale of two sides. You lose your healing, but you do more damage. As you see, our sucker punch comes out. Doesn't get it though because that attack drop earlier. 
and now it looks like Matty can just go for a combination of moves. It does a chunk with that Grass Glide. Stomping Tantrum should be enough to clean up here, and it is. And Urshifu goes down, and Matty takes that victory again after such a close game. It looked like it could go anyone's way until that very last second, but Landorus again showing after every game we've had so far on the stream. Look, Intimidate is nothing to scoff at, and it's going to get you down on your knees and just you know get the players completely removed yes i've got urshifu not being intimidated that's like 100 knocked out the landers and also i think the urshifu was also at minus a one attack oh sorry minus one defense from that close combat drop and i think maybe oscar was thinking he could pick up the knockout onto the very heavily equipped iron hands but unfortunately he just missed the knockout which meant that the urshifu got knocked down too well with that minus one and took a lot of damage from that grassy glide and stomping tangerine and I'm kind of curious, had he gone for a winter blow that turn, maybe he could have survived the Urshifu at the late game. But of course, you know, Maddie just showing us exactly why he was a top eight world, uh, world com 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 <laughs> oh, no, com the person who competes, competitor, <laughs> that's the word, <laughs> showing us why. And you know, making those really great adjustments in both games two and three, he showed that he knew that this Dragonite was a problem and he was really hard on targeting it. Dragonite being suspended couldn't actually protect him against any attack. On the downside to having to go for those choice items, I suspect, like from Oscar's side, you can protect Dragonite and take some of those hits a lot better to effective. And from Matty's side, you couldn't go for a status move to make sure the Sucker Punch didn't hit or change a priority move to make sure it didn't hit. But that, of course, is just the case that it does happen. And I do also believe that with this victory, Matty is essentially guaranteed getting to top card unless there's some really weird, like, mass that means <laughs> no, no, like, no one makes it. But Hopefully, you know, that fate doesn't come, and hopefully that is something we'll be seeing in the future, because we have got those top cut rounds coming up very soon. We've got one more Swiss round coming up just after this one, so we'll hold tight and see who we have on screen for that. But hopefully we have a very, very fun win in to watch going forward.
welcome back Pokemon trainers. We are here at our final round of the Swiss of our Orpington MSS and we've got Max Waterman or his unit in uh, up against a Teddy French who is a senior but currently undefeated so both players really really strong and you know looking to get that final win. Of course I think Teddy is guaranteed the cut because uh, because he's undefeated. I'm actually not quite sure how it works in the seniors. Uh I think we've got enough seniors just they just kind of play and then get the position. So oh, okay. Teddy is just playing to guarantee he gets that final spot. Like, yep. no one else of seniors is at that rating, which is why he is playing against Masters right now, which means he's pretty much guaranteed that first place with going home with 50 points to his name from just for today alone, actually. Tomorrow is also another day. But he is running a team that is very, very familiar from earlier in the stream. Uh, he is running the exact same six that Oscar just ran in the Masters division going against Matty. And of course, because Oscar just came up from the seniors division. They've been quite good friends. They've probably built together for a fort. Let's bring the same team, see who does better. And currently, Teddy's doing a lot better being in that 5 0, but of course, Oscar's still staying quite strong going into it. And of course, up against them is another very, very well seasoned player, which is Max Waterman, who we had in our past Orpington streams, who top cut both PCs, I believe, and is running a very, very hyper offensive team in comparison to what we're seeing from Teddy. It's also a team that likes to run itself in Trick Room because it has its own Ursa Luna as an Enamorous, as well as other things like Indeedy, Torkoal, and Armor Rouge. And then Litigant Siri comes that fast mode to kind of like round things up, and you never really see it. Yeah, it's more of like a ladder Pokemon, so it's nice to see that it's in this stage where it could maybe make it to top cut in our first MSS back here in the UK. Yes, I think Litigant, you know, the Hisuian version is slightly better than the, the, the regular version because it doesn't have, besides Sleep Powder, which is always that 25% accurate move, the rest of its attacks are actually 100% accurate, which is very, very nice against, say, a regular Lilligan, which has to rely on a 90% accurate move form and also dropping the Pokemon to attack in the process. So, you know, Lilligan's close combat Solar Blade deals huge, huge amount of damage. Of course, Solar Blade's helped out by the sun. It also means that, you know, the, this Lilligan's Without the sun, it might not be able to, you know, get that solar blade off in time because it is a true to target attack outside of the sun. That makes the unfortunate job like a running solar blade alongside its cousin solar beam. But you know, it's just something I do with something so strong. It's normally there to sleep on after you with options to attack. But you know, I see those options are executed because our players are really, really close to going into their game. Now, of course, you know, Teddy is kind of put on the hot seat with whether or not they go for Trick Room or anything, because it means that if they go for that Trick Room, then they're actively setting up for Pokemon such as that Torkoal now coming in <laughs> to do loads of damage. And if you go for that after you eruption this turn, you're dropping loads of damage. Even if Cresselia lives, it's activating Trick Room, and then it is going to allow the Torkoal to kind of run rampant without having to rely on the Ligon next to it. Yes, Teddy leading with the Cresselia Ursaluna in the case that maybe he wants to go for that Trick Room turn one. Ursaluna can just protect this turn to make sure that it does not get hit with a really strong eruption and then next turn once it gets burned it can't be put to sleep anymore but this Cresselia is holding a mental herb so it can be put to sleep by the sleep powder if a Max manages to land as a sleep powder onto it so we'll see what kind of moves each player will be choosing of course Torko being slower than Ursaluna is actually going to enjoy the Trick Room going up, so you know, I wonder if Teddy is going to actually click that Trick Room button because he'll be helping out that Torko instead. Yeah, I'll be helping that Torko completely. Of course, Sleep Powder can hit and it can miss given its accuracy. And that Terra Water isn't going to help it all too much. Yes, it's going to take a couple more hits from this Torko should it go for an attack, but it is going to become even weaker to this Lilligan when it goes for a super strong attack. There's a Protect from the Ursaluna that you mentioned, so that is going to be nice and safe getting its, its Flame Orb activated as soon as possible, which not only gives it that boost to its attack stats, but also makes sure that it cannot be put to sleep later. But then the Ally Switch comes out and a niche little action comes out where you protect the ice from the same turn you still keep your protect and it means that everyone is nice and safe so really well played there from teddy just making sure that nothing goes on in that early round the trick the flame orb goes off and now this pokemon is ready to go unfortunately though you have to rely on where that solar blade is going and where those sleep powers are going now to maybe stop that trick room or just completely nuke this ursa luna yes this chrysalia also ursa luna is in a really good position but of course it is going to be have to be really careful of that lilligan which can now hit both the ursa luna and 
the Cresselia for super effective damage. And you know, the way Ally Switch works, it's on the same kind of succession bracket as Protect. So the the, the Ally Switch might not be able to go off this turn, but we see a Terra Fire coming off from Max's side. So you know, deciding that, that now's the time for that Torkoal to start attacking. And with that Terra Fire and the Sun Booster, it's going to be dealing huge damage from Lilligan using the After You Eruption. It's going to be loads of damage. We'll see if it can break through this terror water that the Cresselia has opted to go for. We've seen Torkoal's chunk water type before, oh, and it boy. knocks out that Ursaluna completely. Cresselia sitting fine and dandy where it is, but you know what can it go for now that, that Ursaluna is gone? It does go for that Moonblast, which will do a chunk to this Lilligan. Not even enough to knock it out, though. So showing this could be something like a slightly bulkier Lilligan, or it could be something like one of those very, very lightly invested Cresselias. But either way, Lilligan's still there, and you're going to have to rely on something like a fake out to stop it from going after you. But if you're Faking out Lilligan, you're not targeting that Torkoal, who isn't going to take very much from Moonblast either. No, that Torkoal being a Terra Fire typing, and you know, having actually quite nice defenses means that it's not going to get knocked out in one hit from this Iron Hands or from this Cresselia. Of course, Torkoal is now the slowest Pokemon on the field. I don't think it's very likely that Teddy is going to want to go for that Trick Room because he's going to be helping out the Torkoal. So if he goes for a fake out onto the Lilligan, that leaves the Torkoal open to attack. And if he goes for the fake out onto the Torkoal, the Lilligan is quite free to just start firing off sleep powders or start attacking so you know Max is in quite a very dominant position here because the Lilligan Torkoal is one of those leads that you really need to have an answer for because you know that after you eruption just deals so much damage but actually the Torkoal is going to switch out this turn it's going to switch out and it is going to preserve the sun for later on should it need it indeed coming on it's going to stop any fake outs which can be very very nice especially if we can see that combo of fake out going into the Lilligan, and of course that Lilligan not flinching, can just go for a Solar Blade, Sun is still active, and probably do a massive chunk to that Cresselia, and if it goes to that, that means it's being stopped. There's that Fake Out, so Psychic Terrain amazingly pivoted in by Max. Here comes that Solar Blade, which is going to be going into that Water-type Cresselia, which is that detriment that we said about earlier, where it, it's Trascalizing to take away that Fire-type, the, the, the damage from the Fire-types, but there's does them a complete <laughs> Solar Blade, and that um, animation <laughs> just goes and rips through it. I haven't seen Solar Blade in a while since you know, people used to tech, oh, it onto, wow. tech it onto Zacian back in the day for like Groudons <laughs> and Kyogres. But that's a Cresselia gone. Normally a Pokemon you don't see get knocked out. And it's just going to be a case of with the Trick Room set gone and the Trick Room being now in the hands of Max, will that be something that he goes to later in the game, especially when there's a, a fast Pokemon like the Urshifu sitting right in front? Yes, Urshifu is looking very, very nice against this indeed. Of course, it does have to be careful of the Lilligan, but the Lilligan is heavily chipped, so even though Lilligan with its grass and fighting typing is going to resist any dark type attacks from this Urshifu, you know, it the Urshifu does have to be careful about you know, getting put to sleep, but looks like the Lilligan is just gonna go for an after you onto the Indeedy. So actually Indeedy not known for attacking, but going for that trick room before everything else. Now, that is a cool mechanic. It is a really good mechanic. I, I didn't even know it did that. Like I, I, I thought, oh, it's gonna like after you, but it's gonna go first out of like the negative six bracket. But yeah. no, getting that trick room automatically, meaning that the Iron Hand becomes faster, and Wicked Blow is now gonna be able to go through and probably knock out the Indeedy. But it does mean Torkoal is now coming in with a guaranteed turn of trick room as well as whatever is next to it can make sure it's doing lots and lots of damage. And if it's that armor route, it's not that armor route, unfortunately, I do believe. And it just means that, you know, we are going to see an Ursaluna coming in. So we're going to see this bear showing off what it can do in front of the bear, you know, the more modern bear that we see. <laughs> the Torkoal should be enough to rip through his team with its Terrifier, with its Sun, with its Eruption. It's got max HP. Everything is on its side. And Ursaluna is just kind of helping, really. It's, it's going to break any Focus Sashes or just get that extra chip damage to break through an Assault Vest or something. Uh, yes, and also this Ursaluna maybe hasn't got the Guts boost right now, but it's still got access to Ground-type attacks, and it's going to be hitting really, really hard on the Iron Hands if the Ursaluna can underspeed the Iron Hands in Trick Room. And of course, with Psychic Terrain up, the Urshifu cannot go for a Sucker Punch to try and reduce the damage of the Eruption. And here we are, we see the Eruption coming off from this Torkoal. Let's see how much damage that does to that Iron Hands. And it is going to be doing a really nice job. But Iron Hands here is surviving with the Assault Vest. But of course, the Headlong Rush coming out does not miss and is going to pick off that Iron Hands. Iron Hands going down and Max tagging it perfectly, doesn't want to bother going into the Urshifu knowing it probably has to protect 
to keep a focus sash, to keep itself going, maybe slow out its terrain to make sure it can cycle punch later on. But, you know, you're in a situation now where terrain is still up, Torkoal's got full HP, Urshif, Ursaloon has now got its its ability activated here. There is nothing stopping here. We do see Teddy does choose to forfeit. I Meaning Max is now one game away from a closer step to getting to that top car, which would be very amazing to see because a lot of people, they actually say bad things about the Indeed Armor Rouge, like psychic spam teams, because, you know, people say it's best of one. It's early tournament team, a lowland team, but showing that you can use the presence of the other four Pokemon on your team to put that pressure down to allow either of these Pokemon to come, you know, either independently or mutually to say, hey, we can do this thing as well. If not, we're going to support the entire team. And that, that using that Trick Room Plus after you play caught probably a lot of players off guard today. Caught me off guard. Yeah, they caught us off guard. So they <laughs> catch the players off guard and just line up the extra team up as quick as possible. You don't have to worry about being knocked out before activating. Is the most insane map. Indeed, Armourish does get scoffed at by some players, but similarly with the Lily Core co combination, that's also what many players consider to be a bit of more of a best of one. But Max here showing that, you know, both these teams, there's a lot of flexibility. He brought the Indeed without the Armourish that last turn, and, you know, that Indeed was actually really, really helpful blocking that fake out and then setting up that trick room before any other Pokemon was able to get, get their attacks off. And of course, the Lily Gets actually dealt put in so much work and actually knocked out the Cresselia, which is not something you normally would expect to see. It's not normally expect to see, and that, that is just one of those things where you trastalize. Like you could, you, if you could trastalize into every type possible, you know, then you'd love to see it. But unfortunately, you have to take the, you know, take the error of, you know, if I turn into this type, I become stronger against this type or weaker against this one. And, and the thing is, just really don't go your way if you get, like, get that pair type wrong. On a team like Maxis, where Pokemon are mostly trastalizing for, for super effective damage or just to kind of, you know, mess about the field like Armor Rouge can go Terra Grass to the Flash Fire Grass, so it's not being hit by anything. Torkoal Terra Fire does loads and loads of damage. Namorous we see is a very tight Thrustalization. Ursaluna is just you know, it's Terra Normal to get even more damage. I guess the only two defensive ones on this team are the Indeedy and the Lulugan Hisui, which maybe we'll see coming into this next game whilst our players are ready. It is going to be a case of that, of course, Teddy trailing a game behind to Max. Max, you know, really, really pushing to get this win. And one thing I want to see is I want to see. That Namorous coming through. So also seen oh. it's, I've seen this item as well. It's that new item we got in the DLC, yes. which means that fairy types finally don't have to rely on the fairy plate to get their, their, their damage boost. Hey, it's about time taken <laughs> about three generations. But now we finally have a nice fairy type movement. Lily Cole coming off one more time for Max. You know, if it isn't broken, there's no need to fix it. Lilligant, you know, just pr proving to be really, really helpful. And maybe this time, of course, Teddy leading with the Iron Hands and maybe just recognizing that the, the you know, allowing that Lilligant to get off all these attacks was just a bit much. And maybe he wants the Urshifu, which actually can attack through Protect. So it's very safe protect and attack with the Urshifu onto his opponent's side. It is it is very safe and like both these players can go for that protect attack or linger for trastization attack. It'll just, it'll just come down to who they feel is the most precious Pokemon right now to, to keep their priorities on. See trastization going to Lilligan, which we know is that ghost type trastization means there is a fake out in that slot. It is going to be saved. And it's got a nice little dainty crown on the side with saying I like the Pokemon where their crown goes like on a point on their head rather than <laughs> just appears on top. And we do see another Trastalization though coming out from Teddy, so both players really wanting to make their way through this. And that is the Trastalization on the Urshifu going into that Terra Dark type, so again that super offensive, just throw down damage and hope something happens, which isn't the nicest thing to see for this now Terra Ghost on the Lilligan. Fake Out comes out though and does go into that Lilligan and means it is going to be a turn behind right now. Sleep Powder does hit as well, so Torkoal oh. is on free reign mode. Oh no, that is a very unfortunate hit for Teddy, but very fortunate for Max, because now that the Urshifu is fast asleep, that damage output is, or it can't actually attack the turn, and allowing Torko really free to get the eruption off, knocks down that Urshifu to its focus sash. Iron Hands, of course, does survive it, but of course, now this Urshifu has, it has been put to sleep, and we don't know if it'll wait. It does, has taken that guaranteed first turn of sleep, but it might not wake up again the next turn, and you know, down to its sash already, without being able to get any attacks off, and also having used the Terra, it's a little bit bit scary for Mac, Teddy's position here. And, you know, Max looking really nice, that Terra Ghost coming in really, really clutch for the Lilligan, just not afraid of any fake outs at this turn. And, of course, there's also that Indeedee and Ursa Luna hiding back. So Max bringing the same four poke on each turn, and we see actually Indeedee switching out, maybe Max wanting to reset, um, get, get some, you know, not wanting to, wanted to force a sucker punch for his Lilligan. 
Yeah, not wanting a sucker punch to be the burden of everything and just making sure you're covering that as much as possible. Of course, you can't tear a fairy anymore. So whatever damage gets thrown into you is going to be guaranteed being super damage from this Urshifu when it goes for two of its stab moves. But you've now opened up the ability to go for that after you plus trick room you know, activation, which is very, very useful for making sure that trick room is up turn one on the get go. If that does go through, then Teddy has to maybe rely on these slow Pokemon in the back if they do choose to bring them. Urshifu going down with the most pitiful <laughs> version of hit. Solar Blade, the critical hit, you know, <laughs> a bit of revenge on Urshifu, I guess, you know, <laughs> making sure it's getting crit itself. But it also just means that Pokemon that was threatening the Indeedee is now just gone. Lilligant doesn't drop to that, that wild charge. Very, very safe now just to go for that after you plus Trick Room play. There's nothing really stopping that combination. And Max looks in a very, very good position now. Even that Cresselia coming in, most of your Trick Room Pokemon are going to be slower. Yes, and I'm looking down at the team sheets. This Iron Hands does not have a Terra Grass, nor is it holding a safety goggle. So even if the Cresselia goes for something like an after... Uh, ally switch there's like if, if the Lilligan can actually hit its sleep how does a one of Teddy's Pokemon is going to be put to sleep so I almost wonder because at, at this position you know Lilligan is quite free to just start firing off attacks if he wants to we see a sleep out of putting that poor Cresselia to sleep so Cresselia you know not really catching a break not being able to do anything this skip turn not getting much on but that is a really really good sleep opportunity there for Max because if you know, you know, we maybe see the Ndd won't go down to the won't go down to anything from this Iron Hands, and by putting that that Cresselia to sleep it means you can't see a Trick Room reversed. So it's very very lucky that, that hit for Max. And by getting that Trick Room up, if it is the move of choice, it means that one of the Pokemon come in the back and can just start running rampant. You probably want to have it be that Torkoal because you can guarantee you're getting damage onto both of these Pokemon. Ursaluna unfortunately cannot hit. The Cresselia until it gets its facade, facade guts boosted, stab boosted, everything boosted. Facade is just so good in that Pokemon. It's so good that they, they, they let it have it still. <laughs> but of course, Torkoal is the option to come in, and it can't terrestrialize into its fire type like it did before, but it's still going to put loads and loads of damage out, especially alongside this Indeedee, who I believe has a helping hand in its arsenal to make sure that even without Terra, you are getting that boost added on top of your attacks. Yes, that helping hand boost is essentially like a Terra boost. So Indeedee going for the help. And I think that should be enough to actually knock out the Iron Hands. Cresselia, of course, is going to be super, super bulky. So it is very likely to survive that. Whoa, oh, that was single target. That did so much damage to that Cresselia. It's, I always thought it was quick, but before I realized it was because the Iron Hands got knocked out and actually the Cresselia had to take a base 150 powered attack from that Torkoal. Yeah, Torkoal, you know, it got rid of both of the Pokemon. So it nearly got rid of the Cresselia, but got, definitely got rid of that Iron Hands. So it is going to come down to this Ursaluna coming in. Ursaluna can protect to get its guts on board. It can get it activated, but Max just knows what they want to do. They know that this is a combination to go forward with. They know just to go, you know, bread and butter, go for that helping hand, go for eruption. Protect does go after helping hand, which can be a bit annoying, but is, there is that protect. So, you know, one extra turn in the hands of Teddy here. But of course, Torkoal is just going to do what it loves to do. And so throw up some, it's going to throw up some lava and so make sure that everything is gone. And with Griselli gone as well, you know, there's no one to go ahead and help that Ursaluna uh, for the rest of the battle and we have to see if this bear can really pull itself through and if not you know Max has gone and you know overthrown this 5-0 player and it's also that one step closer to going into that top cut should you know the resistance or everything fall in their favour. Mm, yes and of course Sun has expired so actually this Torkoal will not be doing as much damage but there's a lot of work cut out for this Ursaluna uh, which has to go through three of his opponents uh, three different Pokemon and Torkoal is going to get that single Single target eruption helping hand booster is that enough and it is, <laughs> is enough. enough to knock out this poor Ursaluna and that both actually both games just got knocked out immediately in one hit from that uh, eruption on the Torkoal. It just got completely destroyed by that eruption and just shows how powerful Torkoal can be. With its terror boost, with its helping hand, with everything could be thrown on Torkoal and that's what I love about these sorts of teams where it's like lots of people just see like oh it's just click buttons and stuff happens but the fact that you have to think, you know, I can sacrifice my terror to then use my helping hand to boost it, or I can sacrifice my helping hand to then terrestrialize. If sun's gone, then you know you have either of those things to get that, that sun boost back, essentially. And then with the Pokemon around it, you can just really, really, you know, push the presence of why they're powerful. And changing up the mode completely, having Lilligan just go for after you and so using attacks, and having it go for the sleep powders to guarantee those game modes that could have been in Teddy's favor were eliminated was really, really useful because you, know, you could have seen the Trick Room being reversed, which would have been very, very hard, because even though the Earth Lunar is a Trick Room Pokemon, it is still faster than that Torkoal outside of it. 
experience. That's why I literally going to talk is such a good combination. Because you part your opponent can't go for a trick room because of the talk hold, but then the loser is so fast that you know you can get that immediate turn one uh, after you option going off. So now that Max is guaranteed his top cut, so I, I think a lot of the players should be finishing off their matches now ever, ever since. So we will find out very very shortly who our top eight players for the Masters uh, top cut will be. And so after the break, we'll be back with the top cut matches. <laughs>
trainers, we are here at the top eight match of the Orpington P um, MSS, not PC. And our top eight players are going to be Costa, who we featured earlier with that really cool Alola Ninetales team. And Jared, who has not been on stream for this MSS so far, with running a little bit more standard team or, you know, Rilla Boom, Tornadoes, Chempow, Heat of Bombing, but with a Koma O. So our second one for today. So it's our second one today, and it has really been picking up. We saw Wolf Glick use it in like massive online time when this happened, and it just kind of picked up from there. People started seeing its potential where you can Terra Steel, you can Terra Fire it, you can take on a Flutter Main. Some people are going to have a bulky version of Eye Defense Body Press. Some are going with these stronger versions where it's you know Clanging Scales, Planner Assault, and you just throw damage out with Flash Cannon. And it's just super, super powerful. And then alongside the cast, it's got such as a Rilla Boom for its health, Bladeus for its speed. You've got a heat try and switch in naturally on things like Flutter Main and your own Flutter Main to kind of put pressure on any other Flutter Main or anything faster than you that you can put pressure on. And Chen Pao really helps when, yeah, it doesn't help it directly because it's a special attacking one on this team. But Chen Pao helps things like the Rilla Boom put that more damage out. It's not spreading its own damage. Of course, Cost, as we saw earlier, is, is very, very similar where you've got like kind of like a Protect the King sort of thing where you've got like your Snow Mode and your Heat Tran and the Rilla Boom Landorus Oropon. So kind of that similar sort of. Firewall or grass core, finding who's the best to go in this role and then working with that. Yeah, and I'm um, just looking at both the players' teams, there's actually quite a bit of difference. You know, only the Rillaboom and the Heatran is actually the similar across both teams. Otherwise, but it's quite strange that like the Costa doesn't have Flood Main and we that's one of the most common Pokemon, but of course he is rounding out with that nine tails, you know, supporting the team with the roll belt. And I'm um, also looking over at Jared's team. That tornado is a very unusual Sea wind and air slash, so not not very common. But we are going to go straight into the game. Jared leading with that Tornadus and Fluttermate versus Costa's Alandorus and Heatran. Yeah, so it's something we've seen, we've seen Costa go with every single time he's been on stream. Because it's just one of those modes where it will work super, super well into everything that you see in front of you. If it's something that's a physical hacker, Landorus covers it. If it's something that's slower than Landorus, it can do strong physical damage to it. And if not, you can always you turn out and bring in something, you know, not in the healthiest position, because you are maybe taking damage that turn, but you're still bringing something in. And Heatran, just to sit in front of a lot of Pokemon, like Tornadus and Flat, I mean, currently in its typing right now, pre terrorization are not doing any damage to it whatsoever, besides maybe a, a strong Shadow Ball. And we think with Icy and Air Slash being your only options from a Tornadus, it's not going to do much. And we just see the opting for Protector on the Flutter Main, covering something like a Stomping Tantrum coming out from Landorus, who actually goes to that Rock Slide, which can be detrimental over Sin or throughout today's broadcast. <laughs> yes, Rock Slide, managing to connect this up, does actually a lot of damage, but the Icy Wind coming off from that Tornado, so not a very common movement, does so much back to that Landorus, and Icy Wind is not like a same type attack bonus, and it's actually a very low base power, but Landorus, of course, being times four weak to Ice, is not going to enjoy taking that, and Magma Storm does manage to connect on that tornado so tornadoes has been knocked out without being able to set up an ice uh without a tailwind but it has managed to get one icy wind off so both the landris and the heatran are at minus one uh speed yeah and that can be very very beneficial because mm. where tailwind have sped up the flutter main made it faster than that choice scarf it also makes sure that you're putting a lot of chip damage out on that landris icy wind even though it's a weak move if you go into one of these pokemon of all times weak to it it is going to do a lot in return alongside that speed drop and of course with neither of these Pokemon having any item to stop that speed drop from happening that is going to be very very crucial of course there is opportunity when you have like this sort of field of play you can switch out to get rid of that drop so it's not as good as tailwind so cost was kind of worked out that position where it's if i remove this pokemon as quick as possible there are no tailwinds there are no further activations of some oh there's no, there's no further activations of anything like those icy winds or any other move but it covers it. Landris is switching out, probably covering for something, you know, maybe fizzle attack later on the game. It's Rillaboom comes in, which normally can take a few hits when Pokemon is sat in front of it. Yes, and Rillaboom with the Assault Vest is going to enjoy, or it's, uh, it's going to t tank a lot of the hits from the Fluttermane and the Koma are really, really well. But actually, this Moonblast from the uh, Fluttermane, which is holding a Life Orb, does quite a lot of damage. And Clang Rassol coming off from this Koma O is going to raise all of its stats up all at once. So, you know, even though I don't think Koma O is not able to actually hit the Heatran for very big damage, but of course, the more boost it gets uh, as, as the game goes on. On, and if Costa allows this Como to start boosting more and more, it's going to start laying down a lot of hurt. It's going to lay down a lot of hurt, especially with that throat spray on top, meaning that a noise sound based move activates an extra stipulation, meaning it gets a further special attack boost. So it's now 
plus two special attack, and then it's got plus one across the board in every other stat. So that thing is going to be very, very fast going forward and very, very strong. Plus, the main will take the chip damage from that Magnum Storm, which means that is on a timer itself. It could be forced to switch, it could be forced to stay in. It itself can just, you know, throw damage down on, onto either of these Pokemon and start to put a bit of pressure on them. Whether or not it will be pressure that is beneficial is, you know, up to whatever goes on for Jared here. But both players seem to be in a good position. Costa has that field position where you got the Magnum Storms off with two very, very healthy Pokemon. Whereas Jared has a position where he's got his Komoro set up, and Komoro, even though it's not got super effective moves, it is threatening a lot of damage, as well as just continuous boosts from its move that it can use. Yes, Fluttermane is going to withdraw to reset that Magma Storm. It's worth noting, because of the ghost typing, the Fluttermane is not trapped by that Magma Storm. So Jared, you know, choosing not to take any more chip damage from that Fluttermane, it's going to switch in that Chim Pao. But of course, it, that Chim Pao is going to take over half damage from that Priority Grassy Glide and Clangorous... So clanging, clanging scales is going to hit and going to knock out that Rillaboom through its Assault Vest. Yeah, it knocks out through its Assault Vest is showing how powerful that boost is. And of course, you do take a sacrifice of dropping your defense stat, but with the original Clangorous Soul, you still do get that buff to it. So you're at neutral now. You're doing very, very good. And you know, with the moves that are in front of you, you're, you're happy with it. Heatran doesn't have any super effective moves into this Komoro unless it paralyzes. But knowing that that is the case, I think Jared can just hold back and sit quite comfortably and say, you know what, I won't bother. Yes, I'll let the Magna Storm chip me away. Yes, you know, I'll get the both the damage you do to me and the chip I get. But that could be something you sit quite comfortably. And when you have that Flash Cannon as well, no, like Nine Tails coming in is going to be very, very scary because it hasn't got that Focus Sash and it's going to be four times effective. And even though we saw Nine Tails take some hits earlier today, it isn't going to be really wanting to take that. Landris does come in though and it's going to drop and intimidate down that Chen Pao, but will it be enough going forward, especially since it has got that four times effectiveness onto it? And each ran again is just relying on pure damage rather than just the bulk it had in other matches. Yes, this Heatran is going to be able to hit the Chen Pao for super effective damage, but it is also going to be hit back for super effective from Chen Pao's Sacred Sword in return if the Heatran chooses to stay in its regular form. But of course, if the Heatran does go for the Terra Fairy, it is going to be hit super effectively by that Como O. So I think, you know, at this stage, it looks like Costa's maybe just relying on the Landros's attack drop on that Chen Pao for the, for the Heatran to actually survive, because Como O is now at plus two special attack which is making it very very scary as an attacker and it's also a plus one so I'm not sure how well the, uh, in terms of speed how the, the trainers have trained their Landris versus the Komo whether or not Landris will still outspeed the Komo after a uh, after a, a boost but you know, both both Pokemon going for the protect this turn just to maybe scout out what that choice scarf Landris is going to go for it is a pretty good double protect there. It means both of them are covered from a heat wave, covered from a rock slide. Most of these moves that could come out, you know, are, are completely covered. And also means that you have that one extra turn to see what, like you said, the possibility of what comes out. And kind of just knowing what you can go for, like you can just spread that damage out far and wide to make sure that both of these Pokemon are being hit. You could maybe burn the Komoro. It's not going to be really bothered because it's a special attacker in this form, but it does still have that chip going on it alongside that Magma Storm, which can be very, very beneficial in getting rid of it, especially when neither of these Pokemon yet again have the super effective damage onto it. Besides Landris, we have to terrestrialize, but because it already has committed to that move that it's been choice locked into, it can't rely on that straight away. We'll have to switch out to activate it. And of course, U-turn helps with that. But at the same time, you know, you're U-turning to a Pokemon, which could be very, very weak. And then Sucker Punch comes <laughs> up, though. Doesn't quite get it, so the U-turn will go off. Will we enough to knock out Chen Pao? It is. So threat is gone. But then, again, depending on what comes in here, could that threat then just be, you know, returned in that Como? Yes, so now uh, Costa is going to bring out his final Pokemon, the, the, the little Ninetales, which is not holding a Focus Sash, so... If Jared predicted this and went for a uh, flash cannon onto that nine tails, onto the Landris slot, which is now a nine tails, but it goes for the clanging cell. So, very good switch in here. You know, Heatran is happily resisting that dragon type attack with its steel type uh, typing, and even though it's at plus two, took it really, really well. You know, an earth power doing some a nice chip with through its special defense boost but of course the magma storm is slowly chipping away at this comma o and forcing cost uh, not costa jared to bring out his final pokemon yeah with the final pokemon coming in it, it does seem a better position for costa of course you have got a very very fast and strong pokemon 
in the nine tails should it be ev'd in a way to maybe want to you know opt for that speed and, and offense i'm guessing because it's got the light clay it's going to want to be more of a bulkier version of nine tails just because it has it has to hold that bulk it has to stay on field as long as possible but again you know the typing it has it's going to be super effective into this comb row flutter main can maybe cause a bit of issue unless it can get an icy wind off to make sure it's slower and the heat train can slowly snowball its way with those stat drops into being better Protect is the option though, just make sure it's nice and safe in front of both these Pokemon, knowing there's a Flash Cannon coming, knowing the Moonblast or Shadow Ball can come. Never protect as well, just covering anything into there. So again, seeing a similar like reverse play from Costa, where it's, you know, I'm going to see what you're doing and I'm going to try and work around that. There's that signature Flash Cannon. We'll have to see what comes out from the Flutter main, just to kind of get a taste of what is going forward. And is the Shadow Ball going to that Heat Ran? So just kind of doing like a crisscross, covering every base possible of, you know, I can knock something out or I can put enough damage onto something and it is going to cause a, a dent into your into your play and make sure that I have the upper hand in the 2v1. Yes, and all of the Pokemon are now slowly regaining their health from that grassy terrain. Also, Heatran holding the leftovers is going to be get, getting back quite a bit of health. And now now that the Flutter main, because it's choice specs, the Costa mm. knows it is locked into Shadow Ball. So grassy terrain is going to expire, but I think Heatran has recovered enough health to the point where he might be able to survive the Shadow Ball from that Flutter so it looks like uh, Costa probably ha is very comfortably in the lead for this game. Yeah, Costa does feel very, very much in the lead. And of course, with this rationalization coming out, that lead can be strengthened even more. I believe that is a water type rationalization coming on through. Although that is actually translation from the Flutterman going to Fairy type. So that could be very, very scary. Like, yes, you still have the steel typing on that heat ram. But we saw earlier today with many, many Fluttermains that with that Terra Fairy, it is not something to try and ignore. And it is it is a life or variant rather than a choice spec. So it won't be doing as much damage. And you are risking yourself of chipping away at yourself. Of course, that terror water there as well, meaning that you're going to take less from that flash cannon, but still take roughly the same damage from the Dazzling Gleam or Moonblast should it come out. They're the Clanging Souls, so really, really playing Ooh. through there, not falling of that traffic rationalization. <laughs> you lose that defense, doesn't really matter, and Gleam comes out, and could we just be enough to get both these Pokemon after how much damage that Clara Scales did? Oh, yeah, oh, that Heatran took it so well, like times four resist, but of course, Ninetales lost its fairy typing, so, you know, Jared making a really, really good call going for the Clanging Scales there, knowing that the Ninetales was so heavily threatened by that Flash Cannon that it had really not much choice besides going for a, uh, oh, but the knockout, so he tried finally uh, landing on uh, both of its moves and taking uh, the double knockout for Costa. So Costa is going to take game one. That flood mate, unfortunately, wasn't quite enough, the Terra Fairy, to knock out the Heatran. And, you know, the, the Komo, -O, even though it was so boosted just by virtue of Heatran's fantastic typing, was able to tank all of those hits. Yeah, it took all those hits and just allowed Costa to really push through and persevere through that battle. A couple of times where it looked like Jared could maybe take him, but then just that, that end game there was, was a good prediction. You know, it did look very, very well with going for like going for the Clara scales instead of trying to get that trying to knock out the flash cannon. It did open up that vacuum where Heat Tran could say, okay, I'm just gonna throw damage down. I've got Magma Storm going, I've got Heat Wave. You know, you're at low enough HP, it doesn't really matter. And it paid off really, really well. As well as Nine Tails, you know, just put that pressure on where it's like if you if you go for one of these moves, it could be immune if it doesn't terror. If it, if it does terror, then you could waste a move. So that's a very good mind game that allowed Heatran to take a few more hits and just sit around for a bit longer as well. And you were forced into that terror very dazzling gleam, try and take a few more hits there. And it, it, it worked out perfectly fine. Like both players knew what they wanted to do. And you know, it was just lucky that Costa had that end game in the hand. Then. Yeah, and I think Costa was probably feeling very relieved that his heat train starting to get a bit more accurate now <laughs> after that early game where he kept missing the magnet storm. But you know, taking that double knockout with the heat wave was such a big catch. Could have been a very different story if the heat was not able to land like, one of the heat waves off because, of course, it was heavily chipped and Fluttermane can deal good neutral damage with that Shadow Ball. So I, I really want to see what kind of adjustments both players will be making. We haven't seen an Aurora Bell coming off from this bulky, bulky Ninetales. So, you know, maybe Costa showing that, yes, there's, there's snow and there's Aurora Bell, but, you know, if you can go for defensive terrors, can go for you know, different, like, switching in and out, you might not need to go for that Aurora Bell. You might not need it. I, I want to say I want to see it, because, you know, it's one of those new Pokemon, you want to see it using its signature move over yeah. and over again. I just want to see that Backscalibur come, <laughs> because uh, look, I'm looking at it, it's like, normally, you, you see the team that it's facing into, like, you can think it's got the Ice Crash of Rillaboom, so it's Linatus. It can hit Fluttermane quite well. Chem Power and Heatran are a bit of an iffy situation, as well, but then you can also hit into Komuro for a decent amount of damage. If you tear into that Poison, 
Platinum is now doing less for you. And then those super effective steel type moves are still, you know, they're not completely neutralized, but they're doing less. And there's no fighting type things on Kamoa, unfortunately, to try and say as a fighting type you can take. But I have also this clock that is a loaded dice variant by Scalable, which has been picking up a bit more, as well as Scale Shot as one of the options. And that's a move that people kind of just ignored because it was, it was so inaccurate that no one wanted it. But the fact that you can do less of damage, you can get a stat boost, and you, you, know, you sacrifice a defense drop, but we've seen Kermora sacrifice defense drop, and Vaxcalibur is basically this generation's Kermora. Nice. To pull that sort of style off, especially if you can catch a Kermora on a switch in before it rascalizes. But yes, and both players have now selected their leads. We're going to seek the Kermora and the Rillaboom against the Ninetales and the Heatran. So I'm really, really happy to see the prettiest Pokemon in VGC <laughs> make its way onto the field. Of course, Snow is going to activate. Grassy Surge is also going to activate. And now this Ninetales is quite heavily threatened by a flash cannon from the Como. It is threatened, but of course we do know it has that terrestrialization option. So we have got that mind game on turn one forced onto Jared, where Jared knows that it's Terra Water. Jared knows when it can terrestrialize and why it wants to terrestrialize. So could we see that same slip up where it's the, or even prediction, I guess you could say, where it's going for the, the clanging scale to try and be like, okay, you're going to Terra Water, I can hit you now. But at the same time, if you if, if you don't call out Terra Water, then you go for the Flash Cannon, then you've got it. If you then try and call it and you go for the clanging scales and then you stay as fairy type, things can happen. Fake Out, of course, is always a great benefit to stop it from doing anything, something that Nine Tides always hates to see. And there's that clanger Soul instead of those scales. So it's getting its, its boost plus its extra boost from the Throat Spray. So it's a very, very good situation, and the, the classic fake out plus boost, and then Heatran can't really touch our touch to the Komoa. It can maybe then this Rillaboom, but is that going to be enough to really stop the flow that Komoa can set in place again? Yes, and now this Komoa is very much a nice and set up Heatran for miss uh, hits another Magma Storm. So Costa is probably very, very happy now, and the Rillaboom <laughs> is unfortunately trapped. But it is worth think, worth noting that Jared's Rillaboom does have high horsepower. So if he chooses to, it can heavily threaten that Heatran. But of course, now that the Rillaboom is on a timer, you know, it can't switch out because it's not a ghost type. You know, there's really Costa could just protect his Heatran this next turn to try and uh, mitigate any damage from this Rillaboom and once the Rillaboom goes down there's no more high horsepower and the Heatran is quite free to be able to stay in because Heatran probably is not going to want to go for a Terra Fairy and then take super effective hits from this Como. It's not going to want that whatsoever and that just kind of nips it in the bud completely. It's forced from position where it can't switch. It's got to rely on going for that damage and trying to call protect or maybe a switch on Costa's behalf. But in that state, if you try and focus completely down on this Heatran, you leave nine tails open to just go for something like Aurora Veil, which can be beneficial for the rest of the team, especially with that protect going off to trying to play things completely safe, not taking a Moonblast or any ice type moves. Grassy Glide comes out and doesn't do overly much to showing how bulky this nine tails can be. And it is Icy Wind is the option to go with. So it could knock out this Rillaboom if it does get a nice roll, especially because it's weak and it does get it. So let's see what the Heatran goes for now. No matter what it goes for, it's mostly attacking moves, it's going to go into that Protect, but it still just has that good position where Rillaboom now can't be looped, so we can't see any fake out shenanigans to stop either of these Pokemon from having that offensive presence, you know, just gifted to them and having one of those Pokemon such as just faking out what's next to the Heatran and saying, okay, Heatran can't do any damage to you and just slowly chip away at it. Yes, this Heatran is in a very, very happy position right now. I think looking over at Jared's team, he has he's only got the Chen Pao left that can actually hit the Heatran for super effective damage. Tornadus isn't going to be able to do very much. It's got Air Slash instead of Bleak Wind, so you know, a single targeting move. This Ninetales is, of course, still quite heavily threatened by that Como being able to use Flash Cannon, but we've seen Jared actually quite conservative with the Flash Cannon so far. He, he hasn't really clicked it, maybe you know, trying to fish out a terrestrialization from Costa to so that you know, he doesn't go for you know, a, a super non not very effective move onto say a water type Ninetales and you know Ninetales is going to stay on the field has not gone for the Aurora Vale yet but we, we can I think we saw a glimpse of that Terra maybe Ninetales wanting to just make sure it survives this turn and that is one of the best options that you can see coming from this Ninetales making sure that it's sitting comfortably it's going to go for that Terra so now it's going to be that game again of did Jared predict what is going to happen if they did predict it and go for that clang, clang scales that's going to be amazing because we know how much the 
the knife has already taken. It is that flash oh, yeah. cannon though, and even it is a plus one, but doesn't do very much. And with the moon blast, possibly prominent, it is going to throw down a lot of fear. Air slash carrying through, and just like rock slide, everyone loves and hates <laughs> to see it. It can miss, it can hit, it can flinch, and then oh. the knockout there, oh, that four times effective crit. So every boost you can think of going onto that comb warrior knife. Some may say that roll may have mattered, but um. I think I think everyone knows back ahead didn't, and then of course the revenge there with that air slash flinch. That one definitely did matter because that means that Costa cannot use anything like a magma storm to trap and chip away at this tornado, which means it's now happy to go for its air slashes again into the nine tails. And now it's not an ice type; it's going to do even more damage. And with heat round coming in as well, it can start throwing down any damage it wants to if there's a tailwind or any flinches preventing further play. Yes, I think that that flinch was a little unfortunate, but Costa still got all four Pokemon in. Attacked. And this Ninetales isn't actually going to be taking any super effective hits from this Heatran because it's now a Terra Water type. Of course, I think Jared's Heatran does have the Earth Power, so it can hit Costa's Heatran for super effective damage. We see a terrestrialization coming out from Jared's side, possibly into the Heatran. Yes, so that Heatran is going to go for a Terra Grass to try and reduce any super effective Earth Powers coming off. Of course, if the Ninetales does survive this turn and uh, start hitting the Heatran, some sort of ice type move it the heat train is not going to enjoy it even if an icy wind not not gonna knock it out in one hit but it is going to be very very it's gonna lower its speed but nine tails finally does manage to get an aurora bell off it gets it off and of course in such a rough situation you always you know cost a pro saw that air slash and thought you know what this could be the flinch that ruins me the game <laughs> and but it is now in a situation where both of these pokemon are weak to that icy wind it's not the strongest move but it's still stab it's still super effective and you're still getting that ball rolling of getting those drops unfortunately costa hasn't got the best of times trying to attack into that heatran because it can only hit with earth power with his own heatran so it's going to be focusing down on that tornado most likely to make sure that can be dealt with and then maybe bring in some of the land arrest to use rock slides to chip away that's the only other downside to heat transtrastalizing is it doesn't have that you know that better roll into things like rock slides because air slash comes through gets knocked out of nine tails so no worry whatsoever of these speed drops and it's going to come down to whoever is targeted by this heat ran most likely that's on us just to get that chip going again yes he tran going for another magma swarm and a very accurate heat tran this turn does a lot of damage that tornadoes so now tornadoes is going to be put on a timer, but Earth Bell coming in. I think this Heat Run, yes, it does manage to cling on thanks to that Aurora Bell and the snow stopping just in time. So, you know, Costa timing that Aurora Bell so well, doing it on that last turn when the Nine Tails is going to get knocked out. And, you know, the Nine Tails isn't that strong offensively anyway. So maybe Costa's probably quite happy that he just now gets a free switch into it. And I think we did see a glimpse of what he had in the back, which is a Landorus. And the Landorus can't go for the Terra Blast. Terra flying, but of course Rillaboom comes in and Rillaboom does have the U-turn, so that is something that will hit the Heatran for super effective damage. It will hit it with super effective, and of course the Landorus also has U-turn, so even without a terrestrialization, it has a way to hit in it. So we could just see a constant loop of U-turns to make sure grassy terrain is still active for healing, and also making sure there's you know just you know, even though the intimidate doesn't really matter, but you can still have that gratitude of saying you've looped in day in that end game. So it's just going to be who can play it safest and squarest. As you see the fake out coming through, going to that tornado, making sure it's gone so there's no tailwinds, there's no air slashes, nothing to slow down Costa's side of the field. But of course, the only slowing down is the fact that Earth Power is the only offensive move, and it does, you know, a, a chunk, but not the chunk that you really want to be seeing. Heat Wave comes through, doesn't matter that activated that Flash Fire, because what fire type moves can the Heatran go for? And Rillaboom actually comfortably mm. takes that, especially for that Aurora Veil. Yeah, that Rillaboom took it so well. This is a super effective hit coming from Heatran, which is you know quite well known for having really high special attack. But as you said, the Aurora Veil and the Assault Vest just you know adding up. So making that a super effective hit, really more of a neutral or maybe just even like a resistant hit. But Rillaboom now is quite free to start going for U-turns onto the Heatran, which with the Grassy, uh, grassy terrain gone, actually none of the Pokemon on the field right now can currently act actually recover so i think this is just a matter of costa slowly chipping away at this terra grass heatran and that's all he can really do he can chip away he, he can he can try and maybe preserve that u-turn until he knows it's going to be a definite knockout and that that is just a case that you might have to follow with woodhammer comes on through and does a decent chunk <laughs> even with that grass typing so it is just showing the power that rillaboom has alongside that grassy terrain does activate the barrier, which I believe is a citrus. It is a citrus barrier, so you're going to heal right back up 
So now we're just going to see what the case is. We could maybe see that U-turn come out a little bit later to try and maybe chip it down and have, have that again that U-turn loop. <laughs> Ruboom hangs on on 18 wow. HP. Uh, of course, Costa is now getting to a point where maybe he should start thinking about going for that U-turn to preserve this Rillaboom so he can come back in with it, fake out, and have Heatran, even though it's doing very little damage, do enough damage to consider it chip. And again, you can just, you know, I guess Costa might be trying to wait out for that those grassy train turns to end to make sure he's not giving any free healing back or actually resetting it. It's just one of those ones where you can either go for that super damage and hope or just start throwing things down. Earth Power comes out doing little by little enough to break away it. And here comes that U-turn, which is Ooh. just a sliver away from getting a knockout. Yes, and now that the lander is coming in, I don't think he can get knocked out in one hit from this heat train, even if it got hit with a critical hit uh heat wave or and getting burned because now this heat train is so heavily chipped and we saw that the the umbrella boom on costa's side is faster than the heat train so there is a guarantee you can come in flash cannon just really not doing that much to the landers so i think costa has this game to pretty much locked up at this point so very well played you know utilizing that nine tails really really well and just forcing his opponent to actually target it down but then you know going for that nice defensive terror and allowing to survive that flash cannon so i think here we see you know the heat tran on costa's side is not going to do much but i think jared realizing that the game is a pretty a lost at this point and we, we're going to the congratulations to that top four place top eight match. One step closer to that finals, and of course, one step closer to even more championship points, which are very, very crucial at this point in the season. If you can rack them up early, you can then get lower and lower positions in those bigger tournaments like regionals, intermats, and you can still maybe slip your way in to a nice big world's invite. Also, it has been done in a way, you know, like I said, he just used the team very, very well. Nine Tails was used efficiently to make sure that Aurora going up it had Heat Round just being super bulky, and then having that combination of Rillaboom plus Landorus having an unexpected flow of damage into the Pokemon like the Terra, Terra Heat Round. Because normally you think, okay, Heat Round's Terra, none of these Pokemon can touch it. But Woodhound did loads, U Turn did loads, and then just having two U Turn Pokemon, yeah, even if it wasn't stabbed, they're very, very strong, it just put that pressure on because you never knew what was going to be there and why it was going to be there. Yeah, this generation of turn attacks, I think that Ninetales was probably half the best defensive turn. I think that Ice, you know, giving it way too many weaknesses, but you just simply throw that away and, you know, set up a short longevity on the field, set up an Icy Wind and a Roar now. So now that uh, we've got one of our uh, players into the top four, I think the rest of our top eight matches are finishing up. And we're going to find out who our semi-finals players will be. So after the break, we'll be back with our semi-finals match.